any electronic devices and try and keep them away from the mics because they are sensitive and picking up any interference. We have apologies from uh, Gordon Dunn and Gemma Dolan and we're hopefully going to be joined uh, remotely um, by Patsy and Emma. So unless there's, I think that covers any other apologies. Okay, I'm going to ask the clerk if she just wants to indicate the issue around delegated authority under the new provisions that were passed in the Assembly, Understanding Order 1156. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, just, uh, I know the microphones are sensitive, but it's actually, you know, they're so far back from them that it's actually hard to hear there, Paul. When you're okay, thank you. Um, for the record, Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to the Chairman, Paul Given. And Gemma Dolan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. Gordon didn't trust Paul to, to vote the right way, so he gave it to me. Right. Draft minutes of the meetings that were held on the 19th of March and 23rd of March. There are pages 5 to 10 of your meeting pack, and if you're content that they're a true reflection, then uh, please indicate, and then I will sign them accordingly. <coughs> content. Okay. Um, some matters arising. There's a letter from the Minister for Justice in terms of the commencement of the provisions of the Coronavirus Act 2020, uh, pages 14 to 15, from uh, for the letter uh, from the Minister uh, in respect of those provisions that was circulated electronically to members earlier in the week, and it's just for members uh, to note. That correspondence, and uh, I know I think we're going to cover aspects of this later in the meeting, so it's just for noting. Uh, item two is a memo from the Committee of Finance on the 2020 21 budget process, pages 16 to 17 of your meeting folder. Uh, the Committee for Finance has indicated that, given the current circumstances, oral evidence session on the budget that had previously been agreed should be scheduled for the meeting on the 23rd of April would not be appropriate and instead the committee should consider the written information to be provided from uh, DOJ and members' questions should be submitted for the department to respond to within 24 hours to enable the committee to consider and agree its position on the budget by the 30th of April. So uh, it's just to seek members' uh, agreement with this uh, revised approach. Um, pages 3 to 20 of the table pack um, is a copy of a further briefing paper on the budget scrutiny process and the template that's been provided uh, by RAISE. So that information's there for members, if you're content. Content, OK. The Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, item 4 on the agenda. Um, officials are here to outline the provisions. It was introduced on Tuesday uh, by the Minister in terms of the first stage, uh, and officials are going to come in now and provide an overview uh, of this uh, bill which then will be subject to a second stage introduction at a uh, date to yet to be agreed uh, for that introduction. Um, so can I welcome uh, Dr Veronica Holland, Head of Violence Against the Persons Branch uh, in the Department for Justice, uh, Jane McGuire, uh, Head of uh, Family Courts and Tribunals Branch, and uh, Detective Superintendent Anthony McNally uh, from the Police Service of Northern Ireland to the meeting. Um, this session will be recorded by Hansard and the transcript will be uh, published on the committee uh, web page. Uh, so Veronica and Jane are going to be at the table to outline the bill's uh, provisions and during the question and answer session members Anthony will then replace Jane at the table. Um, so where there are questions relating to the police service and more operational aspects of the bill uh, he will be able uh, to advise on that. And can I Apologise to some of those people appearing. I know that was due to happen at a previous occasion, given the circumstances you weren't able to, and because we had to evict people from the building by six o'clock. So, um, Patsy, that's perfect timing to have joined the meeting, just as we're about to hand over to the set to, to the officials. So you're very welcome. to try and, and get the, the sound through to you. Um, 
as best we can. So I, I'm going to hand over to officials at this stage and invite uh, Dr Holland to provide an overview of the bill. Thank you and thank good you. afternoon to everyone. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to brief you on the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. We're obviously very pleased to have had the bill introduced and um, to be bringing it forward for um, progress through the Assembly. Um, I suppose what we would all want to emphasise is that we're very keen to work with the committee and members and if there's anything that we can do um, as part of the process to help facilitate uh, your scrutiny of the bill, more than happy to do whatever we can in relation to that. Um, Chair, as you've said, I'm Veronica Holland. I'm Head of Victims and Witnesses Branch and Violence Against the Person Branch in the Department of Justice. And with me are Jane McGuire, Head of Family Courts and Tribunals Branch in the Department, along with Detective Superintendent Anthony, Ma Anthony McNally from PSNI. Left the conference. If members are content, I was going to deal with substantive and supplementary criminal justice provisions, and Jane will then deal with the, the family proceedings provisions in the bill. Um, after that, then the three of us are obviously more than happy to, to deal with any questions that you may have in relation to the provisions. Um, before looking at the detail of the bill, it may be helpful if I just set out some background and context in, in relation to how we've got to, to where we are, and I suppose to give an overview of some of the engagement that we've had with our voluntary and statutory sector partners. Um, as part of the bill development, uh, a multi-agency task and finish group was established to consider the criminal provisions, so the core domestic abuse offence and some of the protections within the bill. And this involved a range of our voluntary sector partners, including Action on Elder Abuse, Men's Advisory Project, NSPCC, Nexus, as well as Women's Aid Federation. We also had representatives from the statutory sector, which included the Police uh, Probation Service and the Public Prosecution Service. So all of those organisations have been involved as, as part of the, the policy and legislative development process. Uh, the groups were involved in relation to the development of the original Assembly Bill when we, we met again when we were taking the legislation through Westminster and we've also kept them updated in terms of the, the more recent progress through the Assembly and really that engagement has been in critical to us in ensuring that the provisions are as robust as, as possible and that we can incorporate the views of those groups. The new offence, as you'll be aware, is very much focused on non-physical abuse, in particular what is commonly known as controlling and coercive behaviour. Uh, the offence can also capture physical and sexual violence, should that be present in relation to that abusive behaviour. And it will apply in relation to both intimate and close familial relationships. Effectively, the legislation is intended to deal with the type of behaviour where men or women, young or old, are controlled and coerced, be it financially, economically or socially. <coughs> so any type of abusive controlling behaviour would apply under the new provisions. Where their daily activities are controlled to a considerable extent and they're unable to freely maintain relations with friends and family members, are no longer financially independent, are belittled, degraded or are subject to unwanted sexual behaviour. As part of the bill provisions, we've provided for three aggravators. There are two child aggravators associated with the domestic abuse offence, where either the, child, the victim is a child, and that is in the context of an intimate relationship or a family member, and the exception there is for an adult parent-young child relationship, or where a child sees, hears, or is present um, in the context of that abusive know. behaviour. We also have a general aggravator that would apply where there is any other offence, for example, criminal damage, and it's aggravated by reason of involving domestic abuse. And where an aggravator applies, there would, of course, be an enhanced sentence, an enhanced sentence um, available to the courts up to the maximum that would otherwise be available. Turning to the detail of the bill, I'm going to provide an overview of the main clauses before looking at the supplementary provisions. And for ease of explanation, these aren't necessarily in the, the same numerical sequence as they are in the bill. Clause 1 makes it an offence for someone to engage in a course of abusive behaviour, so that's on two or more occasions. Um, and is against a partner, former partner, someone they are in an intimate personal relationship with or a close family member. And the offence is subject to two conditions. The first is that a reasonable person would consider that the course of behaviour would be likely to cause the person to suffer harm. And the second condition is that the accused either intended to cause harm or was reckless as to whether or not harm would be caused to that individual. So as a result of that, the offence can then be committed regardless of whether or not harm is actually caused to the individual and they are off the view that harm has been caused. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Clauses 11 and 17 provide that the domestic abuse offence or an aggravated offence would not apply in the context of someone having parental responsibility for a young person. Essentially, we're not seeking to criminalise parents who, for example, remove privileges from their children. We also don't want to legislate where legislation is already in place, as is the case with regards to child protection. The provisions may, however, apply where two teenagers are involved in an abusive relationship or where there is domestic abuse of a parent by an adult child. 
And importantly, there are also the child aggravators associated with the domestic abuse offence, as well as the other offences, which I'll explain in more detail later. Clause 2 sets out what amounts to abusive behaviour. The description is not exhaustive, and it includes violent or threatening behaviour, including sexual violence, as well as abusive behaviour more generally, and that is behaviour directed at the victim, their child, or another person that may have certain effects on the victim, so it does not have to be abusive behaviour that is directly towards that individual. The effects are deliberately broad and capture a range of abusive behaviour, so for example, making the victim dependent on the perpetrator, isolating them from friends, family members, or sources of social interaction or support, controlling, regulating or monitoring their day-to-day -day activities, depriving or restricting their freedom of action and making them feel frightened, humiliated, degraded, punished or intimidated. The types of behaviour could include, for example, preventing a person from having access to money, forcing them to leave their job or education or controlling their movement or access to friends, family or a variety of means of communication. It could also include controlling access to the outside world, what the other person wears, how they behave, as well as preventing them from carrying out day-to-day -day activities on their own and without being monitored by the perpetrator. Clause 3 outlines that the effects of the abusive behaviour, such as that dependency, subordination, isolation and control, don't have to have caused harm in order for an offence to occur. Rather, as set out in Clause 1, it is sufficient that a reasonable person would consider that the behaviour would be likely to result in harm. And this is intended to cover situations where a victim may not consider that they have been harmed, that the behaviour has been abusive, or effectively those situations were due to either their resilience or the abusive behaviour being normalised. It's not considered as such. Clause 4 sets out what is meant by behaviour for the purposes of the Bill and how it can be carried out. And it's basically providing clarification that abuse can be carried out with or through a third party, whether knowingly or not. So I suppose. The range of those provisions is trying to encapsulate as broad a range of behaviours as possible and also that abusive, behavior, that abusive behaviour being carried out through a, a range of means. As I noted earlier, the Bill provides for aggravation with the potential for increased sentencing where domestic abuse is involved. So Clause 8 provides for aggravation of the domestic abuse offence itself and that would apply where a person under 18 is involved in the context of a young person in a relationship or against a family member. Clause 9 then provides that an aggravation of the domestic abuse offence could also occur through abusive behaviour being directed at a young person or then being used to facilitate abusive behaviour, whether knowingly or not. The aggravation under Clause 9 would also apply where the child sees, hears or is present during a single incident of domestic abuse that forms part of the course of abusive behaviour. So from that, you can see that there are a range of ways in which abusive behaviour involving a child would be engaged under the, the provisions in the Bill. Clause 15 provides for any offence other than the domestic abuse offence to be aggravated where it involves domestic abuse. So this could be with a charge of, for example, criminal damage, assault, sexual offences, essentially any other offence that is in the domestic abuse offence but is carried out in a domestic setting with abusive behaviour involved. The Bill also contains a range of measures to reduce the potential for the perpetrator to use the criminal justice system to further abuse a victim, and we felt that it was important that, that these <coughs> provisions were included within the, the context of the Bill. So clause 21 prevents the accused from electing for trial by Crown Court in summary proceedings, that is where uh, the proceedings could be um, uh, taken under either magistrate's level or Crown Court level, and, and that's in relation to the domestic abuse offence and in order to prevent further um, abusing an individual through that, that more serious or higher tier court level. Clause 22 will enable those subject to the domestic abuse offence or an aggravated offence to automatically be eligible for consideration of special measures when giving evidence, and that would include things such as live links, the use of screens, etc. Clause 23 would prohibit the cross-examination of an individual in a criminal court by the accused, where this relates to either the domestic abuse offence or an offence aggravated by domestic abuse. And then turning to some of the supplementary criminal provisions in the Bill, Clauses 5 and 18 set out what is covered by personally connected, respectively for the purposes of the domestic abuse offence and also an aggravated offence. And this broadly covers those that are married, civil partners, those that are living together or have been in those types of relationships or are otherwise in an intimate personal relationship. The clause also sets out that family member broadly covers parents, grandparents, children, grandchildren and siblings, so we've deliberately kept that relatively tight. Clauses 6 and 7, as well as clauses 19 and 20, make provision that it can be proposed that a relationship between two individuals be taken as established unless this is challenged. 
and Clause 10 relates to extraterritorial jurisdiction. So essentially that's making provision that where domestic abuse and the abusive behaviour occurs outside this jurisdiction um, that is in a, in, a, in a foreign country, so outside of the UK. The accused is normally resident in Northern Ireland. That behaviour can be encapsulated as part of the domestic abuse offence locally. So, for example, if someone were on holiday in Spain or France and abusive behaviour occurs, that can be um, taken forward in a, in a Northern Ireland context. Clause 12 provides for a defence where a person can show that the course of behaviour was reasonable. Um, for example, restricting access to household finances where an individual suffers from some form of addiction or on safety grounds as a result of an illness, so for example, if someone had dementia. But essentially, the purpose is to recognise that behaviour that might otherwise be considered abusive in terms of restricting uh, the, the actions um, where an individual can go, what they can do, who they can see, that that may be justified in certain circumstances. Clause 13 provides that where the domestic abuse offence is brought forward and it's not possible to convict of this, that the court may convict of alternative offences under harassment legislation, where the evidential threshold for that offence is met. And we would also intend that this would cover stalking offences in due course. Clause 14 provides for the penalties under the bill, so that's a maximum of up to 12 months at magistrate's court level and up to 14 years at crown court level, as well as a fine or both at each court tier. And the potentially significant sentence in relation to Crown Court is intended to reflect the fact that the offence can incorporate both non-physical abuse as well as physical and sexual violence. Finally, Clause, 26, sorry, Clause 25 sets out that the Department will issue guidance related to the domestic abuse offence, and our intention would be to develop this in conjunction with both our statutory and voluntary sector partners. That's a, an overview of the criminal justice provisions. Jane will now provide an overview of the provisions related to family proceedings in the bill, after which, as I said, the three of us are more than happy to answer any queries that, that members may have. And as I said, we're more than happy to discuss how best we as officials may facilitate the committee um, as the bill is going through the assembly process and as part of the, the committee scrutiny process. So thank you. Thank you. Jane. Thank you. As Veronica has said, uh, I'll be dealing with the clause that relates to family proceedings. That's clause 26, which will insert new provisions in the Family Law Northern Ireland Order 1993. The purpose uh, of the provision made by this clause is to protect victims of domestic abuse from being cross-examined in person by perpetrators or alleged perpetrators in family proceedings in order to prevent perpetrators exploiting cross-examination as an opportunity to further control and abuse their victim and to support victims to give their best evidence. Uh, before outlining the provision that the clause makes, um, it would be helpful just to briefly give members some background. So, At present, uh, courts hearing family proceedings have no specific powers to prevent uh, cross-examination in person. This contrasts with the position in criminal proceedings, where there is specific legislative provision which prohibits an unrepresented defendant from cross-examining their alleged victim in certain cir circumstances and enables the court to appoint a legal representative to carry out the cross-examination instead. The Gillen Review of, of Family Justice, which reported in 2017, highlighted uh, this difference between family proceedings and criminal proceedings and recommended the introduction of legislation to afford victims giving evidence in family proceedings the same protection as is available in criminal proceedings. The Department uh, therefore consulted on options for legislation last summer, and a large majority of respondents strongly supported the introduction of legislation. Turning then uh, to, the, to the provision in the Bill, uh, there are three main elements. The first is that there will be an automatic prohibition on cross-examination in person in family proceedings in certain circumstances. These are uh, where one party has been convicted of, given a caution for, or is charged with certain offences against the witness, or vice versa. And uh, these offences will be specified in, in secondary legislation, but we would anticipate they'd include, for example, offences related to domestic abuse or violence, sexual abuse, and, and child abuse. The automatic prohibition would also apply where an on-notice protective injunction is in place between the party and, the and a witness. And again, uh, relevant orders will be <coughs> specified in secondary legislation, uh, but would include, for example, non-monestation orders. 
An automatic pro prohibition will also apply uh, where there is other evidence of domestic abuse perpetrated by a party to uh, the proceedings towards a witness, or vice versa. Uh, the forms of evidence, uh, again, will be uh, prescribed in secondary legislation. And, uh, this uh, particular uh, provision has been included in response to views expressed by consultees who considered that the scope of an automatic a automatic prohibition should be wider than the other uh, four triggers which I have described. Uh, so that was the relevant conviction, caution, charge and protective injunction, which, which were all specifically consulted on. Turning then uh, to the second main element, where the automatic prohibition does not apply, then the provisions will give a court hearing family proceedings a discretionary power to prohibit cross-examination in person where this would be likely to diminish the quality of the witness's evidence or to cause significant distress to the witness or party. And uh, third, thirdly, uh, the third element is that where cross-examination in person is prohibited, whether it's under the automatic pr prohibition or on the direction of the court, the court will have power to appoint a legal representative to conduct the cross-examination instead. So the judge will have to consider if there is a satisfactory alternative means by which the witness can be cross-examined, uh, and if there is none, the court must invite the prohibited party to appoint a qualified legal representative to carry out cross-examination on their behalf. <coughs> if they don't uh, do that, then the court can appoint a qualified legal representative for the purpose of conducting uh, the cross-examination on the prohibited party's behalf if it considers that this would be in the interests of justice. The costs uh, of a legal representative appointed by the court will be met by the department, and there is also a power for the department to issue guidance about the scope and nature of the rule. Uh, this ability for the court to appoint a publicly funded uh, legal representative is to ensure that where a party is prohibited from cross-examining in person, their Article 6 right to a fair trial is, is still protected. And, uh, just really to conclude by reiterating. Uh, what Veronica has said about how we're very willing to uh, work uh, with, with the committee, that also um, applies from the, um, uh, from the family justice perspective, and um, I'm happy to take any questions that members may have. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and I know, Anthony, we're going to make sure that you have an opportunity to, to contribute. In fact, there, there may be a microphone. There is one in this <coughs> There may be there may be one there on that bench. If you want to sit there, then then that's fine. We'll, we'll be able to pick you up. Um, so, th thank you for that information, and I appreciate that this is we're at the first stage, and we need to get into the second stage, and then there's going to be committee scrutiny and 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 all of that to come. So we'll be able to get into a lot of the detail on this in the the weeks and the the, the months ahead. Um, just a, a couple of brief questions that I just wanted to ask, and I think. Um, Jane, you helpfully laid out some of the new provisions for the family courts, mm -hmm. where criminal court currently can protect witnesses from personally having to give evidence, and, and I think that is something that um, will be will be welcomed. Um, in terms of the overall bill, what, one of the obvious questions that people will be asking is, how does the this new proposed law actually do a more effective job than the current law that exists? So that we are introducing legislation because we have identified there are gaps, not just that there hasn't been enforcement or implementation of existing law. So maybe Veronica, are you able just to outline how this new piece of legislation builds upon what is there already and how it addresses that? The main thing, really, in, in terms of that gap, as such, in, in terms of the offence itself is the fact that at the moment the police only have enforcement powers and prosecutions and taking people to port court is restricted to those provisions where there's physical or sexual violence. So that abusive behaviour, the controlling behaviour, the the, the behaviours, I suppose, that are abusive in, of individuals and much less obvious um, are the ones that we are now going to be able to tackle once this is taken forward. I suppose in addition to that, there's also the fact that there's going to be additional protections for those individuals as they're going through court. So, for example, that automatic eligibility for consideration for special measures. In, victims of domestic abuse are obviously able to avail of special measures at the moment. Um, that change will allow that to be an automatic um, consideration as part of the process. It will obviously still be for the judge to decide whether or not those special measures are granted. 
um, the prohibition on a cross-examination. At the moment, there is provision in relation to that, but it's in, a, in relation to a, a fairly restricted um, number of offences at the moment, so in relation to sexual offences, trafficking offences. So I suppose those are some of the, kind of the, the key new changes or the additionality that the Bill will provide. It really, as you say, it is about closing a gap in terms of what are offences at the moment, um, what is criminal or non-criminal behaviour. We're obviously all of the view that that abusive behaviour is very much wrong, it shouldn't be happening, um, but at the, at the moment we don't have, have the powers in, in order to charge individuals in relation to that and either to imprison them or, or have them subject to a fine. So as I say, it's closing that gap and then the additional protections at court are probably the main things. Okay, uh, and in, in looking at what's been put into the legislation, these provisions, what was the kind of models of best practice that you looked at both within these islands and also internationally did, was there evidence taken that has helped inform this piece of legislation so is that was one of the key pieces of work that we would have undertaken in relation to the multi-agency task and finish group that had been set up to look at other jurisdictions in terms of the type of offenses that they had in place at that time the republic of ireland wouldn't have had an offense in place we looked closely at the provisions in england and wales also the provisions that had been in uh, put in place in, in Scotland, some other jurisdictions. That task and finish group was very much of the view that they felt the Scottish provisions were, were robust ones, so they were ones that they were most attracted to, and I suppose that's the model on which we have most closely based our provisions at the moment. Okay. And, and the, the behaviour that occurs outside of the UK, um, can you just elaborate a little bit more on, on how, how that evidence will be used if, if you're committing it in Spain or wherever, yeah. you know, outside of these jurisdictions, how that will then be used to get a successful prosecution? I suppose the, the case would or the offence would effectively work in the same way as it would at home. It would be for information and evidence to be gathered in relation to that in terms of what abusive behaviour or what, what has happened in that other jurisdiction. Um, the offence could potentially be taken forward on the basis of all of the behaviours occurring abroad where the individuals um, are based here. It could be that there is some abusive behaviour here, some abusive behaviour abroad, but, but the same principles, I suppose, in terms of what the police would have to consider, what the public prosecution service and what the court would have to look for would be the same regardless of where, where that abusive behaviour had, had taken place. Um, you know, and I suppose it, it will be a matter of, of seeing how best that evidence and information can be gathered. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Linda? Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of wee questions. Just in relation, I suppose, to, to Paul's last point, I would actually welcome that, that what happens abroad can be taken into consideration because it is well known that very often that domestic violence can be worse whenever people are out of the country, when they have them away, completely isolated from their family. And it very often happens on honeymoon, which is that person's first opportunity to get a real um, go at the person that they've just married and, and have, have committed to looking after and being good to and that's their opportunity to actually abuse them. So I think that actually that, that is, a, is a positive step. Just a couple of questions. You, you had said that secondary legislation will deal with the non-molestation orders. I'm just wondering, is there a possibility for that being dealt with within the, an amendment to the, the primary legislation? It's an issue that comes up repeatedly, and we have raised it here in the, the committee before, that people very often, victims, are not in a position to be able to afford to apply for a non-molestation order, and they're very often time limited. So where they may borrow money or gather money together to get a, a non-molestation order, the perpetrator will take them back to court within a number of weeks and they're back to the same position where they're having to reapply and, and pay again. So I think in the stocking bill there is something around the police actually, the PSNA, taking that for taking that element forward. It's not a non molestation order, but it's a similar kind of thing, rather than the victim. Is there a way of doing that or a way of ensuring that low income families particularly, so they're outside the bracket for any help in terms of legal aid, but they can't actually afford to apply for non-molestation order and they certainly can't afford to be repeatedly applying for them and having to get a solicitor to, to go to court on their behalf. So th that's a real issue and even the fact that they're having to go to court themselves and take time off work. That leads into my next point. In the in the south and 26 counties there is um, provisions for time off work leave, special leave, 
where there is domestic abuse taking place rather than people having to use up their holidays or take sick time and then again getting into trouble with their work and up potentially becoming unemployed because of their circumstances. So if, if that was something that could be addressed. And then the last thing, the Chief Constable, whenever he was here, said that there was a gap in legislation that didn't allow the PSNI here to do what is done under Operation Encompass, which means that where there's a domestic violence incident in a home, that the PSNA can contact the school before 8 o'clock the next morning. There's a point of contact that means that the school know whenever that child comes into school that they potentially won't have homework done, won't have the correct uniform, possibly may not have eaten, may not have slept all night, may not, you know, may have been sitting in, in a police station for the best part of a night, so, or, or may be coming from a care background where they normally came from their own home. So I just think those kind of things are, are extremely important in terms of the, the follow-up and that if we can get that into this legislation, I don't know whether it is something that can be included, but I know that the Chief Constable did say that the, the gap was a, a legislative one at this stage. If it's something that can be included in this, I think it would be a, a, a good step forward. And I suppose in the round, then, it is about not having this legislation um, on its own, that, 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 there's, that there's more work around it in terms of education, and, and that is educating people what a healthy relationship looks like, you know, and particularly where it's, it's violence or coercive behaviour in a, in a case of young people who are still of school age. I mean, that, that's the opportunity to still have that time to hopefully be able to, to alter or change their behaviour. Because we all know it's very often intergenerational. It's 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 stuff that they've seen and, and learned in their own homes, and, and our only opportunity very often then to to change that or to address that behaviour is within the the educational setting. So I think it's important that we have some sort of a, a more rounded picture, and even in terms of um, Justice Gillan's recommendations, obviously there, there's a, a, a massive focus around education, around what healthy relationships look like, and what what is sexual violence and what is domestic violence and all of that. So I think that there is, that is important as the legislation itself because prevention is always going to be better than cure. If I perhaps deal with the later queries and Jane then if I turn to you after that for the, the non molestation one if that's okay. Um, in terms of the provision around time off work and, and special leave being given, that's not one that I'm aware of, but I'm, I'm more than happy that um, the, the team will look at that and, and see what the provisions are in the Republic of Ireland, how that operates, what way, what way that works. That, that's something that we can certainly give some consideration to. As I say, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with that myself, but more than happy to look at that. In terms of the Operation Encompass, um, we have a task and finish group set up in relation to that, so it's involving representatives from Department, Department of Health, the Health Trust, Police, um, Education. There's a, a range of organisations sitting on that at the moment. I think what we're hoping to do in relation to that is to try and do some form of pilot in relation to that type of model where there's notification, you know, how best, I suppose, within a Northern Ireland context and our, our current provisions, how best we can um, make provision for notifying school of, schools about those incidents so that they're aware of that trauma that, that a child may have suffered the, the night before. There is certainly an issue, as you say, around the, the legislative provisions. Um, further discussions are needed between ourselves and officials in the Department of Health in terms of what exactly the legislative change would be needed to give effect to that. But certainly that's something that, that is being looked at by the, the Department and our partners at the moment. And as I say, we would like to be in a position that some form of pilot of, of an Operation Encompass type approach um, could be introduced later in the year. It's certainly being looked at at the moment. And then in terms of your final point around education, awareness raising, healthy relationships, you know, certainly agree with that in, in terms of the importance of that. Um, in terms of the work that we as a department will be taking forward um, in relation to this, there will need to be a significant programme of training, awareness raising. I would imagine that what we will do is look at um, rerunning and tweaking the advertising campaign that we previously have had around domestic abuse and the disclosure scheme, running that on TV, radio, billboards, etc. And we'll obviously want to also continue to engage through our strategic delivery board and our stakeholder assurance group in, in terms of the educational side of things and, as you say, the importance of healthy relationship advice, ensuring that, that those changes and that change in culture can be introduced at, at the earliest stages possible. 
So if I maybe turn to you, Jane, on the uh, station. Yes, I mean, in terms of uh, what the bill is doing and the, the secondary legislation, that will simply sort of prescribe almost a list of current protective injunctions that are available uh, that would, if they're in place, would trigger the automatic prohibition. Uh, but in, in terms of sort of the wider point around applying for orders like non-molestation orders and, and financial considerations, um, I, I, th I think that in terms of the legal aid provision, and I'm saying this slightly off the top of my head because it's not my, my area, um, I think there is um, a special sort of provision where uh, the application is uh, for a domestic violence remedy like a non-molestation order, but I can take that away to uh, my, my colleagues who I think would be better placed to, to comment. You know, it's an issue that's repeatedly um, come up and I've actually dealt with people directly. Um, who are in this position, and th there, there isn't what is in place is not sufficient to, not to protect low-income single who, people who usually end up being single parents at that point where they're trying to. to in terms get the of parent. the legal aid provision, is that what you're? It, the, the, the provision is, is the legal aid is fine if you're below a certain income, but if you are and you're still somebody who's low income, so you could be potentially earning, say for example, twenty thousand pound gross per year, which sounds okay and it is okay, but some people on benefits are earning that and they're automatically going to be entitled to legal aid. A single parent who has three or four children, that's not a big income and they're struggling to meet their, their financial commitments. You're very often talking about people here who could have potentially large mortgages because they were part of a couple and they probably were in some cases financially doing okay when they were part of a couple, but all of a sudden they find themselves on their own trying to meet all of those bills and they can't, literally do not have the money to get a non-molestation order. So they do not have, that, those are people who are left in a position where they cannot afford to protect themselves, where they cannot afford to put something in place that keeps that person away from them. And it's, I know it's a challenge that the PSNI actually come up against all the time because they're saying, you know, do you have something in place that, that can make us make it easy for us to arrest this person? And that's what they really need. That, that, that's the kind of powers they need, that they can come, that person's anywhere near your home. It makes it so much easier to be in their position, so much easier to do their job, to be able to say, they've broke the non-molestation order, restraining order, we can deal with this easily. So I, I think that that is something that is important, and I think we should be ensuring that somebody who is... Ten pound, twenty pound, thirty pound over the threshold shouldn't be left that they are in a position that they cannot afford to protect themselves because they cannot afford to put in place a non-molestation order. Well, I, I hear, I hear what you're saying, and I know certainly um, I've heard that, um, that that issue has been raised uh, with the department previously. And if I may, I'll take it back to to colleagues in the department to who deal with with the legal aid um, for, for them to consider. Okay. Thank you. Rachel? Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation and going over the clauses. I would completely agree with everything that Linda had said there. Um, so just in terms of looking at the provisions for time off, I know that happens um, elsewhere in the world, so it would be good to get some further information on that, if that could be considered. Um, with regard to one of the clauses, I, think, I believe it's called Clause 12, and the, sort of the intention and reasonableness um, and it's mostly it's detailed in those in care, who are in caring relationships and those who are um, mentally or physically disabled. Um, and how the concerns which, which was brought up and quite well known with the experience of the English and Welsh legislation and if that has been addressed within the provisions here or if it's the same, but just um, very specific, say could person A who is a carer and related to person B be found to be acting, acting abusively, but be excused on the grounds of reasonableness and how that is covered. Um, I don't think it's specific enough to protect uh, the elderly or vulnerable people, uh, which obviously we need to make sure that that is. Um, and additionally, then something that could, um, has the creation of a domestic abuse commissioner or the grant of secure tenancies for those who are victims of domestic abuse been looked at? And if so, um, could I have more detail about that? And if not, is that something that we could look at? In relation to the defence provision, um, I don't 
I don't think England and Wales have something akin to this, but certainly I'll, I'll look and double check in terms of what their provision is. I suppose the purpose of that clause, clause 12, is really to try and ensure those and, and the, the types of situations that we're thinking of is where, for example, someone has dementia. So it isn't possible to let them out of the house or to let them go somewhere on their own if someone had a gambling or al alcohol addiction. So, for example, you know, to, to prevent them associating with individuals that may exacerbate, you know, exacerbate that, that problem, that difficulty. In terms of the defence, it will be looked at very much in the context of would a reasonable con person consider that, that behaviour to be abusive, and that's something that the courts would, would need to look at. I think we're satisfied that in, in terms of the way it has been drafted, that it shouldn't basically provide those with caring responsibilities, it, it shouldn't enable those individuals to abuse the person that's in their care. Um, it's something that we would want to also deal with quite clearly in terms of the guidance um, and, and we'll of course be working with our statutory and voluntary sector partners in relation to the, the content of that but, but we'll certainly go back and, and look at the England and Wales provisions. As I said the, the provisions that we have are, are quite different from the England and Wales one. Our model is, is much more closely based on the, the Scottish one but more than happy to, to look at the content of that and, and can come back to the committee separately on that if, if there are, are further concerns having looked at that. Um, in terms of the Domestic Abuse Commissioner, um, it's not our intention to bring that forward at this stage. It is something that there has been discussions with the uh, Minister about in, in relation to this. One of the reasons for a Domestic Abuse Commissioner in England and Wales has been in part to try and ensure consistency in terms of the application and provision of services. So because there are such a vast number of local authorities there with very, very different approaches, to try and ensure consistency in terms of the services that are available to individuals to ensure that there's the same application um, across that, that jurisdiction. We obviously don't have that difficulty or issue locally in terms of having a single jurisdiction. It's a relatively small region. We're comparable to one of the local authorities um, in England and Wales. Um, the other issue, I suppose, that we have taken into account in relation to that, the introduction of a commissioner generally is typically in the region or in, entails a cost of around a million pound. Um, you know, so that's something that would need to be looked at in the context of if a commissioner were to be introduced, you know, how that, how that impacts on, on service provision more generally or money that is available in order to support victims um, going through the, the, the system. In relation to secure tenancies, unfortunately, Neither of us are able to, to answer that query, but certainly can raise that issue with the Department for Communities, whose responsibility that would fall under, if, if that's helpful, and come back to the committee on that. Yeah, that would be really good. Um, just to come back on terms of the sort of the reasonable test, um, if say a restrained person with disabilities, if, say if I restrained a person who is to say I was caring for them and were related to me to stop them hurting themselves, but in the process I physically hurt them. Could that be used as a defence? I suppose it, it, the cases will be, will be looked at very much on a case-by-case -case basis, and the court and the police and the prosecution service would have to consider in the context of that situation, was the behaviour that that individual undertook, was that deemed to be reasonable? If the restraint against that individual was such that it was going to actually physically harm them, um, you know, that would have to be looked at in the, in the context of the situation, the two individuals involved, etc., etc. But certainly it's not intended that, that, you know, we would see that reasonableness defence being used in a fairly limited number of circumstances where there are, you know, are quite clear um, problems in relation to those individuals that mean that, and, and I suppose it would be looked at in the context of, you know, that behaviour being necessary for the purposes of ensuring the safety of that individual. Um, you know, as I say, it, it would be very much a case-by-case -case basis depending on the circumstances of that particular case. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And not to put pressure on folks, but Paul's next, and then Doug and Linda is indicated to come in, but we're under time pressure. Okay, I, I'll be uh, sharp as always, uh, Chair. Uh, I suppose this one's probably for Jane, uh, the, the FAM Proceedings Part part 2. Uh, and it's a wee bit along the lines what Linda has queried, other, uh, but also flipping it over. So it is the case, very limited, I'm sure, but it is the case that some people would use court as control or a, as a, an offensive weapon to administer control. Um, we've seen an example whereby maybe a, a, a lady who has tried to get on with her life as children, single parent now, their, their ex-husband or partner 
is using access to children or, or fighting for access to children, children and, and going to court on a regular basis over a long period of time to basically dwindle the resource of the lady because she doesn't claim, she can't claim legal uh, aid, but he can. That's just one example. I'm sure it's a very limited case, but is there any provision in this that, that, that prevents the perpetrator using court as an as a arbitrary tool and a weapon against the person? There's probably not a specific provision as such, but my sure. view would be, and again, it will very much depend on, on the circumstances of the case, you know, uh, the form that that takes, but that is something that could potentially could be considered in the context of the abusive behaviour. Um, you know, if an individual is quite deliberately and it's quite obvious that they are going to court or using other means through which to try and further um, exert control over those individuals, that's something that could be considered as part of the, the domestic abuse more generally, and I suppose what is deemed to be, to be abusive behaviour. Yes. Now, uh, again, everybody has a redress, everybody has the, a day in court if they so wish, but so it's a very hard one to grapple with. But if it was a consistent thing, um, I, I think there's something that maybe could be d put down and used uh, and tightened up maybe in that regard. Can I ask then on Clause 13, an alternative available uh, uh, for conviction? This clause provides that where the court is not satisfied with the domestic abuse offence, has been committed, it can convict the accused of a specified alternative offence of harassment or um, putting people in fear of violence under the protection from harassment in Northern Ireland Order 1997. What examples can you give the committee that of, of, of typical crimes that would then fall under the harassment order as opposed to this new legislation? Or is it just trying to catch all? So there is an element of a, of a catch-all, as we say, there is that harassment provision, the stalking provisions will also come in there as well. I suppose if there's not sufficient evidence demonstrated in terms of the abusive behaviour to enable the domestic abuse offence to be applied, but one of these other offences would potentially be applicable, um, I suppose in order to try and ensure that the court can convict of a charge or an offence, um, those are being put forward as specified alternatives that the court could consider as part of that process. Can you be convicted of both? Can you be charged for both? You could potentially, I suppose, be taken to court originally charged with both. Um, I don't think as, as part of the bill provisions you would end up with an individual being charged with both, if that makes sense. I suppose it's really where the domestic abuse offence wasn't going to be progressed and there wasn't the necessary evidence in relation to that. One of these other offences could then come in as an alternative to that. But I suppose as part of the process, if you didn't start out with harassment or stalking as a, as a charge against the individual, it's not that you could end up coming out the other side of the process with, with both of those applying, but an individual could of course be charged with both the domestic abuse offence along with a harassment offence or for argument's sake a, a stalking offence once that comes through. Okay, I'll leave it there Chair, just uh, thank you very much thank for bringing you. this to us and we look forward to, uh, to the community, committee stage. Thank okay, you. thank you and Doug's content that his question I think has now been covered by Paul, so Linda you wanted a final, you're content? Okay, great. Um, can I thank you all? Sorry, Anthony, we didn't get an opportunity with you, but I have no doubt we will. And there will be questions in the future. It's hoped that a second stage of this will come in on the 28th of April, based on the conversation Linda and I had with the, the Minister. That's the intended date uh, for second stage introduction in the Assembly, and then it will come to this committee for us to carry out our uh, committee stage. So um, I have no doubt we'll have lots more of an engagement with all of you. So. Uh, thank you for your time this, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, can I, I didn't want to take up more time. Maybe it, it's something more that we could write to the Minister on. Could we write to the Minister and ask her if she consider speaking to the, the Minister of the Department for Communities around the gap, around the point system for housing? that. Victims of domestic violence are not awarded points for being a victim and being intimidated mm -hmm. as a result of domestic violence, but you're awarded points if you're intimidated as a result of sectarianism, mm -hmm. of your race, of your sexual orientation, your religion, all of that. So, I mean, th this should be, because we're actually ending up where we have the perpetrator can get extra points because they say that they're being intimidated mm -hmm. by a paramilitary group. Mm -hmm. 
who may be connect, may or may well, I'm, I'm happy to do company. that. I know there is a review has taken place of the housing allocation scheme, um, I, but it hasn't obviously been finalised in terms of the, the outcome of that. So I have no problem with the committee writing to say right. how so can the scheme can what's reflect what's on the domestic I abuse it's, it's victims. Important to find out because that's an important element of, of trying to get them to okay. a place of safety. I'm happy to do that if members are, yeah. Okay. Well, then we're going to move to the next item, um, which is the update on the COVID-19 response. Um, the first organisation we're going to hear from is the Northern Ireland Prison Service. And we've got uh, the director, Ronnie Armour, I believe, who's going to make his way into the meeting now. Um, and at the conclusion of that, we'll move on to the to the, uh, to the police service. So, uh, Ronnie, you're very welcome, and thank you for making yourself available. I know you, at, at short notice and at a time whenever um, you and the organisation um, are obviously under pressure, so we do appreciate you uh, giving the committee this time. Um, we will conclude at half three at the, at the latest. Um, if, if things wrap up earlier, then so be it. But uh, I thought it was important, um, and I spoke with the minister yesterday, that we do get updates um, on how the different parts of the uh, justice uh, arena is responding to the COVID-19 response. And obviously, we had the minister's announcement earlier in the week in respect of prisoner releases. And uh, I felt that we needed to hear from yourself in respect of how uh, that's going to be managed, as well as the overall pressure on your organisation. So I'll hand over to you at this stage, Ronnie, and then we'll, we'll pick up from there. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to come and update the committee on the actions the prison service is taking in response to the developing COVID-19 emergency. Uh, in doing so, can I again uh, begin by paying tribute to prison staff and our colleagues in the Southeastern Trust for the outstanding work they're doing in very challenging circumstances at this time. I'm also very grateful for the support we're receiving from a range of other statutory, voluntary and community sector partners who, in their, re their own way, are playing an important part. Uh, as I indicated when I attended the committee on the 19th of March, our objective is to maintain as normal a regime as possible for as long as possible. Uh, this we have achieved through careful management and with the support of our staff and trade union partners. In essence, our approach is based on three important principles – control, communication and consistency. Chairman, much has changed in the two weeks since I was last here. On the 23rd of March, visiting within our prisons ended, and this was quickly followed by a decision to, to suspend temporary release arrangements and our working in the community schemes. Our house, our working out unit was closed, and we restricted access to the prison estate to those who have an absolute requirement to be there. This resulted in the closure of learning and skills and many other activities that have in recent years become part of the, the daily routine in our prisons. At this point, we moved to a landing or a house-based regime, therefore limiting prisoner movement uh, within each establishment. We have in place isolation units within each prison, and today, as a precautionary measure, we have three individual prisoners in isolation. We currently have no confirmed cases of COVID-19 within our prisons. We are shielding our older population and those individuals who are particularly vulnerable to ensure they have additional and appropriate protections. As the committee will know, and indeed you have just mentioned, Chair, earlier this week, Minister Long gave approval for the temporary early release of those prisoners who satisfy the criteria for the scheme that she has put in place in response to the COVID-19 emergency. The scheme was open to those prisoners in the last three months of their sentence who are not excluded by virtue of the crime they have committed, for example, those who have committed terrorist offences or sexual-related offences. The availability of accommodation on the outside uh, when they are released or their specific health needs. I believe this is a proportionate response that has carefully balanced the operational needs of the prison service with the importance of public safety and victim sensitivity. As a service, we continue to be guided by the advice of the Public Health Agency and our partners in the South Eastern Trust. As far as it is practical, governors have put in place social distancing arrangements in each prison. 
At this stage, we have a supply of PPE uh, to meet our current needs, and further significant deliveries are on order. As the committee will know, we have a significant number of staff absent due to COVID-19. The figure today stands at 197. This equates to 16 per cent of our operational grades. In response and in recognition of the fact that we will require staff to work longer hours, the Minister has put in place a series of overtime payments, and I have been very encouraged by the number of staff who have already stepped forward and volunteered to work additional hours. We are also beginning to see some staff return to work after periods of self-isolation. Central to our strategy for dealing with the implications of the virus is good communication with both staff and those in our care. Sadly, the days ahead are going to be very challenging, and it will be vital that in taking difficult decisions, we are mindful of the impact on staff and their families, and on those for whom we have responsibility and their families. Keeping staff and prisoners well informed and explaining the decisions we take and why we are taking them will be crucial. The unprecedented nature of the crisis we face means there is no rule or guidebook to point us to the right answers. But I was immensely encouraged by the very positive comments contained in letters sent to me by the POA National Secretary in London and indeed by our own area secretary in Belfast, who said, I am very supportive of the stance that has been taken in Northern Ireland to ensure the best protection for staff, prisoners and their families. Chairman, I hope these brief opening remarks provide the committee with some reassurance that the actions we are taking are, de are decisive, proportionate and compassionate as we seek to deal with the uncertainty that comes with planning for the unknown. Bonnie, thank, thank you very much. Um, and let's just get straight into to some of the questions around this. 197 staff currently um, off as, as a result of COVID-19. Um, is that purely to do with COVID-19, and is there additional numbers that are off due to other reasons of sick? Yes, we the 197 figure are those who are off with, for COVID-19 reasons. Uh, in addition to that, we have um, we have normal sick, if you could. If you could put it that way, uh, and the figure today stands at 97. Sorry, 94. So that that is in excess of 25 percent. Well, I'll bring you up to about 23, roughly 23 percent of your current workforce that's Sorry. not available. Um, and was that the determinant factor in respect of? the closure around visitations rather than public health advice, that it was to do with staffing, and also is that the determinant factor for the early release of those prisoners? Uh, not, not entirely. Um, I mean, obviously, we need to pay close attention to our staffing levels, but entirely in terms of the early release of prisoners, you know, it is, imp it, it is important that we bring our population down. Uh, that, that helps with social distancing. Uh, it also helps in terms of it reduces the number of prisoners who are sharing cells, for example, uh, which is good, good practice uh, in terms of the health advice we're, we're receiving. Uh, but, but crucially, it, it also means that you know, when, when the, the more difficult days come, uh, you know, we have fewer people to, to monitor um, and fewer people to manage. Um, and monitoring is crucially important to us when we're sitting with 32 per cent of our staff with 32 per cent of our population with mental health issues. And of those 197, have any of them been confirmed as having got COVID-19? Not, not so far. Certainly not that we have been advised of, no. OK. So uh, in terms of the ability then for those that are having to self-isolate, which I assume is, is all of the, this figure well, there symptoms? Will, there, or will be, there will be some who are self-isolating. There will be others who have underlying medical conditions. Um, and there are some who have relatives that they have to, they have to care for. So it's, it's, it's all of that put together. And are there any of those then that, if the testing was available, could be carried out and then allowed to come back to work sooner? Uh, yes, that's what we're working towards um, in terms of, of getting to the point where we, where we can test staff and if it's appropriate for them to come back, 
by all means, we, we, will, we would get them back, yes. And are there any of those individuals that are off as a result of not having the available PPE or lack of confidence to carry out their job because there isn't the PPE? Is that an issue? No, I, I don't believe that's why staff are off. The reasons they're giving us are that they are self-isolating because they or someone in the household has had symptoms or they have underlying medical reasons. No one has indicated to us that they're off work because of PPE um, equipment. The, the significant order that you refer to for PPE, you've indicated that um, you believe you've currently what is needed. Are, are you able to detail exactly the level of the order that has went in? Um, well, we, we first put an order in for PPE equipment back in, in February. So we were, we were one of, at the very beginning, we put an order in and we've taken delivery of uh, equipment which has been dispersed out to the prisons. And that's what I mean when I say we currently have what we, what we need. Um, in terms of the orders, I don't have the, the precise figures, but um, you know, I know, for example, we've ordered around a quarter of a million masks. Um, we've ordered visors, disposable suits uh, and goggles. I don't have the, the exact figures, but we're talking very significant quantities. And will that be to, to cut out everybody? Well, it, it will depend in terms of how the, the situation develops. But yes, we're working on the basis that we're going to have to kit out very significant numbers uh, as the crisis unfolds. OK. Um, obviously, the, the ministers took the decision around uh, the criteria of prisoner. Um, the governors of each establishment, are they ultimately the ones that will now sign off on those prisoners that fall within that criteria? And can you just elaborate on the decision-making process that the Governor will now use? Well, yes, the Governor will ultimately take the decision in terms of, under prison rules. Um, and the process has been we have drawn together lists of individuals that qualify. Uh, each individual then goes through an individual assessment process. So, for example, you know, prison governors are looking at those cases. We're obviously talking to our colleagues in the probation service about those uh, those individuals, um, and governors then ultimately take take the take the decision, take the final decision. Okay, and finally, for me, um, if if the the picture continues to deteriorate in terms of numbers uh, of of staff, what's the contingency plan? I asked the minister this question about what way you can supplement the workforce um, so that we're not in a position that you're actually facing a problem around the prison regime being able to continue to operate and, and looking at a further category of prisoner being eligible for release. Um, as I understand it, the police do have uh, legal competence to be able to come in and provide assistance. Can you just outline the kind of contingency planning that's taken well, place? We, we have, um, you'll not be surprised that we have a, a, a contingency plan in place with the PSNI uh, for a range of different circumstances. So we've been looking uh, at that plan with the police, both the PSNI and ourselves are content uh, with the plan that we have in place. Um, I mean, moving forward, our approach to this has been throughout has been, uh, you know, to take decisions when we have needed to take those decisions and to try and do that in a measured and managed and an incremental way. Um, and that's how we will continue to approach this um, over over the coming weeks. Um, at the moment. The regime within prisons is, as I said, landing-based or house-based, um, and that's where we are at this time. Uh, we have the staff to, to do that on a daily basis. We're still uh, operating evening association, for example. So um, whilst the regime has changed in the past fortnight, uh, individuals are still out of cells on their landings, um, and we will continue to work through that process uh, over over the coming weeks. So you know, I'm not looking to uh, to change things imminently, um, and we're certainly not anywhere near a situation where we would be looking for support from anyone from anyone outside the prison service. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ronnie. Linda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Um, just, I suppose, a question around the the prisoners themselves. Obviously, I mean, we haven't heard anything but nobody's able to go in, so we're not going to hear anything. But 
in fairness, we haven't heard anything in terms of you know any kind of backlash or prisoners feeling that they're being locked up for too long a period of time or any issues around not being able to get visits and things like that. And I understand there has been, I spoke to the Minister about this, so I understand there has been some measures put in place. And I'm, I'm assuming that that as we haven't heard anything, there are no major issues, that the prisoners, are, for the most part, are complying, and probably because they understand this is a health crisis and it's about protecting them. And, and I would like to think that that is being conveyed to them and that, they, that that's why they understand that this is about protecting them. You see, just in terms of, I suppose, additional, because there are no visits, and, and I understand staff levels and every all of the complications about letting people out of their cells to, to phones and all of that is going to be a difficult one. Everybody using the same phone, for example, and things. But are there measures being put in place to ensure that family contact is maintained in some form, particularly where there, it's parental, child, family contact, because that would be important especially given the fact that this is liable to last months rather than weeks. I mean, if it was a period of weeks, you would say, you know, that that would be OK. But once it runs into months, that would become a problem and become a problem for the prisoners themselves and being able to cope with their circumstances and not being able to have any contact with family. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I've paid tribute today to our staff, and I think it is right uh, that we, we also acknowledge um, and pay tribute to you know, prisoners, the people in our care as well. Um, I mean, they have been incredibly understanding in terms of the situation. Now, they, like the rest of us, are, are watching their, their televisions every night, and they know what's going on in, in, in the world outside. Um, and they were certainly well aware when visits were in place up until a fortnight ago from family members who were coming in who were beginning to tell them about uh, the restrictions um, on, the, on the outside. Um, I have to say prisoners accepted the decision to suspend visits. Um, I think there was a clear recognition that we were taking that decision in their interest as, as much as anything else and in the interest of their families. Um, it, it is important to say that, that we're not locking people at the moment. Um, people are out of their cells all day and for evening association. The only difference at this stage is that they can't go to learning and skills or to workshops or they can't move around. They're, they're contained within their, their house, but, but the free movement uh, around that and around the exercise yards uh, and so forth. In terms of maintaining the contact with the outside world, in some ways we're very fortunate because over the past three years we have installed um, phones in 700 cells. Um, so, you know, all of those individuals have that contact. Uh, and the ability to make that contact in a way that is that is very easy, um, and, and a way that is, you know, what we would we would think on the outside as, as normal, um, and we have increased um, the the phone credit that we're giving to people uh, as well, so they can they can make more calls. Um, for those who don't have uh, phones in their cells, well, they still have free access to the phones on the landings. So up until this point. People can make those phone calls and can keep in contact. We are doing some work, um, and we hope to be in a position next week to introduce uh, some virtual visits. Uh, now, you know, we won't be able to do that for everybody all the time, but uh, you know, where there are where there are exceptions, we will we will be able to provide uh, provide that facility. So, I think prisoners are working with us during what is a very challenging period for all of us, um, and, I, and I have to recognise that and, and acknowledge that. Um, and we are doing everything we can as a service to make, to make the, this as easy for them as we can in terms of maintaining that contact with their families, in terms of ensuring that they're getting their, uh, their tuck shop guaranteed. Um, we have moved our physical, uh, our physical education instructors from the gym, which we've closed onto each of the, the residential landings, so we're doing some work around uh, well-being and, and physical health on the landings as, as well. Uh, but you know, I can't get away from the fact that it's all very challenging, and it's going to become more challenging. Just sorry, and in, in terms of staff, then obviously the the health minister has said that the the testing is going to be ramped up. I mean, you are suffering with significant. Um, levels of understaffing because of, of the circumstance around 
people having to self-isolate and we don't know whether they have. So is there, is there, have you any indication, and even around those three prisoners who you're saying you know, don't know whether they have it or they don't, I mean, it would make, make a big difference for you if you were able to identify they definitely don't or they definitely do? Well, well, we, well we can do that. I mean, it, it, it maybe is worth just taking the committee through the process in terms of putting people into isolation. Uh, I mean, there are two categories here. First of all, if someone within the prison population, uh, if their temperature rises above that threshold, uh, we, on advice from our healthcare colleagues, will immediately move them into isolation, or if someone develops a cough or, or some of the other symptoms. The second group of people are those who are being committed into the prison. So, you know, if we have concerns about people coming in, uh, then we'll put them into the isolation unit. Um, and we're, we're, not, we're not putting prisoners who are being committed into the general population. That's a, a decision that we've taken, that we will isolate all prisoners coming in. But if we have particular concerns, then those individuals will be tested very quickly by our colleagues in the South Eastern Trust. Um, and if the test is negative, then they're moved into the general population. So the isolation uh, process so far has been very fluid. We've been bringing people in. Uh, if we have concerns about them, they have been tested by the South Eastern Trust. Everyone tested thus far has been negative, and they have been moved and then back out into the normal population again. So, so we do have testing arrangements in place for, for prisoners that we are concerned about. Yeah, thank you. Rachel? Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie, um, for that overview. A um, certain number of questions have been answered. But in terms of the safeguarding, um, I know this was discussed a couple of weeks ago about um, potential of early release prisoners, um, about support services for those who are, and can, um, in conjunction then with the probation board, have those discussions happened? And if um, so, do, will they all be in place before anybody is released? Um, second of all, is the kind of learning and skills? And again, this was brought up last time, but has there been any sort of alternatives looked at? Any alternative materials, additional materials for people? Um, who may have been using that uh, sort of education and that activity beforehand. And finally, this is probably for the department, but I tried to get some clarification from the minister earlier this week. But is, are those people who are, say, currently in prison under harassment and breaches of restraining orders, would that count as domestic abuse for the purposes of early release? Because that's been brought to my attention. It's very concerned if they are going to be uh, looked at at early release because we obviously don't have that definition. If I can, if I can take those in reverse, the, the answer to your final question is no, those people aren't eligible um, for, for, uh, for early release. Um, and actually, I think Women's Aid have been very positive, for example, in terms of, of the approach that we that we have taken. Um, so, you know, where there's a concern around domestic abuse um, or stalking or any of the non-molestation orders and so forth that you've mentioned, those, those individuals are not, are not eligible. Um, in terms of the materials and learning and skills, uh, we, we are seeking to provide um, some materials. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying everybody's getting all that they would want at this stage, but we are making, we are making efforts to do that. On the, on the support front, um, I mean, there's a couple of points to make. Support for families. Um, we've been working with NIACRO, who have established a dedicated helpline for families, which I think is a, is a, really, positive, uh, a really positive development. Um, in terms of those people who are leaving us under the early release scheme, we've been working with NIACRO, Housing Rights and Extern, again to set up helplines um, to, to ensure that they get the, the support they need in terms of benefits, welfare, health and well-being. Um, and those organisations have been doing some sterling work uh, in, in supporting individuals and, and again what are challenging circumstances for them. In addition, our colleagues on the probation board um, have offered to provide assistance to anyone that's leaving under the, the temporary early release scheme, even those people that uh, the probation board wouldn't normally have any responsibility for. Um, so again, we've provided individuals leaving the system with telephone numbers where they can um, where they can get help. Um, and then finally, we've been doing a lot of work with the Universal Credit Team, obviously, and DFC, uh, to uh, to make sure that there is support for individuals in terms of, of benefits and so forth. So there, there's a package of support measures that, that have been put in place to cover the different circumstances. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. Doug? Thank you, Chair Ronnie, and thank you for that. Um, I, can I just very briefly put on record um, that I think your officers are doing an exceptional job, uh, and I think they may feel a little bit forgotten because of focus on the NHS, but they're, they're not. They're, it's incredibly difficult circumstances, uh, and, and, and I commend them, and I commend you and all of your staff for regards to, to what they're doing. Um, I, I, I do have concerns, um, Ronnie. I, I mean, there's certain things that you you can't get out of in, in, in relation to this, and routine for prisoners is, is incredibly important. Um, but could you outline the evening associations? What, what is evening association? What is, how many does that mean, and how are you mitigating social distancing or within evening association? Well, in, in the same way as we're seeking to do it throughout, throughout the day, Doug, I mean, normally what will happen in a prison environment is during the day, individuals will be at work or at education or at visits or at health care so you know there's lots of people moving around and you've seen it yourself moving around a prison establishment evening association is that period after the evening meal uh, when when cells are open people can come back out they can associate freely uh, with each other um, and you know they can make their phone calls or or do the the types of things that that they would want uh, that they would want to do within their within their house, so you know, in terms of of social distancing, um, I mean, we're we've we've taken a lot of steps. I mean, I can give you maybe I can give you some some examples um, of that. Um, you know, we've we've moved a lot of prisoners around to try and create a little bit a little bit more a little bit more space for people. We're trying to ensure that people move around the landings in an orderly and a measured way so that we can create as much social distancing as you can. And you know, you you've been in the square houses in McGabry, it's very tight, it's very difficult. So it, it's around trying our best to do that and staff are working at that um, working at that constantly. We have adjusted some of our routines um, and some of our timings so that people aren't, for example, all going to collect their meal at exactly the same time. So we're staggering those sorts of things. So th those are some examples of what we're we're trying to do to to ensure that we have as much social distancing as we can, and that we keep people moving around in a way that that's manageable, proportionate, and, and sensible. I suppose. And, and just following up from that, then, Ronnie, if I can, because you know what, you are under considerable pressures with 23% of your workforce off for one reason or another, um, and we haven't hit the peak yet. Um, and talking about prisoner routine. But, and this might be an unfair question, I'm just trying to get a scale of the problem that you're facing, but at what percentage of, of prison staff being off would you consider a complete lockdown of prisoners? Um, well, I, I'm not sure that I would want to get into a percentage at, at this stage. Um, I mean, I think we are looking uh, at our staffing levels on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, governors are very comfortable that they can run the regime they're running at the moment with the staffing levels they, they have. Now, as those staffing levels would fall, obviously we would have to keep that under review. But I don't think it would be I don't think it'd be helpful for me to, to start to, you know, guess around percentages, but but it's an issue that we, we would keep constantly under review. Okay, and, that, and that's a fair answer, Ronnie. I wouldn't want to put you in that. And can I just lay, raise this last point because I, I have to, um, because I have many staff um, who have been in contact with me, and it's about PPE. Hmm. The staff confidence in regards to PPE is the biggest issue. And it's not just staff contact with the prisoners, it's staff contact with each other. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and we know that there was an issue with the search station initially. I know the search station now has PPE, mm -hmm. I believe, because mm -hmm. there was a huge volume going in there. But I think there's that huge issue that Officers now do and may have to, in certain circumstances, work in close proximity to each other. Um, and I think that concern of PPE is knocking confidence in, in some officers. And if I can just jump on that as well, to, uh, uh, conscious of time, uh, and, and if you could answer this, is there any concern within yourself that the bonus that you brought in, and I understand the reason why you brought in the overtime bonus, will actually drag people into work who shouldn't be coming into work? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think that that is the case, and there's certainly no no evidence thus far to to suggest that. I mean, I think I think our staff are are sensible, uh, and the bonus arrangements have been built around averages. So you know, people can you know over the 12-week period, people can be off, 
and still uh, and still qualify in terms of the hours they, they do. So we've tried to design it in a way that, that mitigates against that. And, and you know our encouragement to, to staff is to be sensible, to look after themselves, and to be mindful uh, of themselves, their families, and their colleagues that they're working with. So I don't have I don't have a concern around that um, at this point. I absolutely take the concern that you're expressing, and I'm very conscious of that around the concerns uh, in, in terms of PPE. And we're hearing exactly the same concerns from the health service and the police and from a range of a range of others. Um, but you know, we are actively working. I mean, we have. We're part of the Northern Ireland order, for example, that, uh, that, that we're waiting for, and we're doing everything we can. Um, we'll be guided as well by our healthcare partners in terms of, of PPE. So, you know, it is available to those who are working in the isolation unit, for example, and I think that's reasonable in proportion at this stage. We, we did implement the masks and gloves at, at, at staff search, um, and again, we did that at a point when we felt that was the right thing to do, but but I am very conscious of the concerns right across the public sector, and we are no different. I appreciate. I'm, and I'm, I'm glad you said that, only because this, this isn't just a health issue. This is this is a justice issue. This is a this is a logistical problem. It is. This, this, it's a huge issue with this PPE, yeah. and it's not just. A and that's a worldwide issue. Too. No, absolutely. <laughs> you know, um, but listen, thank you, thank you. Jim. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, Ronnie, can I thank you very much, and please um, pass on um, my appreciation for what your management team and also the officers are doing, um, as always, stepping up in very difficult times, and I commend you for that. Thank, Thank you, you, Ronnie. Thank you. Okay, members, we'll just wait and we'll change the... Assistant Chief Constable Alan Todd, who is uh, operating Gold Command for the PSNI, is going to be joining, joining us now for the next half hour in this session. Alan, just as you're, you're settling there, can I welcome you uh, to the meeting and just advise it will be formally recorded um, by Hansard and then it will be obviously published in due course. Um, so we have promised only to detain you for uh, 30 minutes at maximum, um, so I will hand over to you at this stage. Thanks, Chair. Um Things from a policing perspective are in a steady state. Um, there are um, no significant strains in the system. Uh, whilst we haven't been, and I, and I don't intend to be publicly definitive around uh, the absence rates, we do have absence rates uh, associated with, it, with the current situation. But uh, that, plus changing in working practices, uh, plus frankly a reduction in some of the demands that we would normally deal with as an organisation around negative economy around retail theft, around road traffic issues. So um, that, that has offset uh, some, of the, some of the challenges we have as an organisation. Um, but clearly, we are planning on things becoming more demanding in the weeks ahead, and we have arrangements in place to do that. But at this point in time, uh, we are uh, pretty steady in terms of, uh, of our demand, pretty steady in, in terms of our capability and our capacity. Uh, and that is uh, all in a, in a good place uh, for policing currently. Um, as you will know, and specifically uh, around today, the regulations came into enforce uh, on uh, late on Saturday evening, uh, and it's pretty early days with that. Uh, but our sense, from a policing perspective, is as, as we would expect uh, that the vast majority of people across Northern Ireland are broadly compliant with those. Uh, and at this point, uh, we haven't. Uh, in terms of trying and understanding that this may be a lengthy process and the need to keep people's goodwill and cooperation, our approach has been very much in that space that the Chief Constable outlined in terms of the three E's about engaging with people, uh, explaining uh, what, what uh, the situation is and encouraging them to comply where, we're, where we feel that they may not be. Uh, and we haven't moved significantly, or in fact we really haven't moved at all towards that enforcement end, which inevitably will come because uh, there's always that percentage of people uh, who need more than encouragement to comply, and we expect mm. that will be the case. But certainly in the first instance, we haven't rushed into that space and, and don't intend to just immediately. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I know you don't want to be definitive on the absentee levels. Obviously, we've heard from the prison service that were able to tell us it's 197 mm. due to COVID-19, plus another 94 to do with other um, uh, normal uh, sickness issues. And I've heard the different health trusts are now giving out precise figures. Um, 
are you able to give a, a kind of percentage figure if you do want to give the exact numbers that are off as a result of COVID-19? I, I think the percentages or the actual numbers are pretty much the same in terms of disclosability, Chair. So if, if you wouldn't mind at this stage, we would like to reserve the right not to talk about other operational implications around that. But I mean, the important thing for the reassurance of the public is that, that there's no diminution of, of service and we're not close to that point either. Okay, because I know that we've highlighted that the PSNI are one of the best performing forces within the United Kingdom when it comes to dealing with the absentee, but it's difficult just to quantify what that looks like in the absence that, of numbers. That remains to be the case, Chair. I mean, and I think, and I said on the media earlier this week, I don't mind repeating it here, that uh, that I think is a reflection of two things. I think it's a reflection of the commitment of police officers in Northern Ireland to provide that service to their communities. Um, but I also think we need to be realistic and say we are tracking a little bit behind. Uh, the rest of, of GB in terms of infection rates, so we would expect to be in a better place than some of our, some of our England and Wales colleagues at this point, and the numbers bear that out. And does that um, is that the basis on which the correspondences went out to officers due to retire this year, if they are able to hold off on that because of a concern around the, the manpower that's going to be there or needed? So, I, mean, I think it was just judicious on our part uh, to, to make that up, make that offer to people that uh, if they wish to consider staying on, uh, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a major contribution to the capability of the organisation. It, it would be useful, uh, something we'd encourage if, if people wish to explore that. But we also understand that people have made their own plans financially and personally, um, notwithstanding the current restrictions, uh, and uh, in their own minds have made up have made up their mind to go. But. As an organisation, we, we regularly see 300 plus people a year leaving. Um, so uh, we thought it was a, a, a prudent and judicious thing to say to those people that if someone wanted to stay uh, and help out in, in this duration, that we certainly wouldn't be pushing them out the door. And do they all leave at a particular time throughout the year, or is it just staggered? It, it's staggered throughout the year. There is, a, 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 and I'm not an expert on this, but there is there is a little bit of a, um, a peak uh, at the end of the tax year for financial reasons and pension purposes. But it, it sort of tracks throughout the year, based pretty much as, as people's retirement age go through. Okay. Um, and we find that sort of half the people who can go tend to go uh, when they reach pensionable service. Um, and then the, the other half is made up from people who could have gone previously and have now decided in the scheme of things that that's what they want to do. Okay. Um, you, you've indicated, obviously, there's an offset of some officers that the nighttime economy doesn't exist, so you're not experiencing the same disruption at weekends from closing hours of nightclubs and bars and so on. So that, that has had, a, I think, a pretty significant impact on the kind of police resource that's available. Can you outline just some of what you would regard as how those normal policing duties have now changed as a result of the current environment? Indeed. So, um, without putting too far into detail, we have a we have a shift system for uniform uniform officers in local districts that provide for overlaps, which provide increased availability uh, at late late evenings and early mornings uh, over the weekend period. Come away from that as of today into a flatter shift system, which provides us with increased numbers across a line, as opposed to making, having to make provision for the weekends. Okay. Uh, that, that means we sort of effectively taken some of the people who would be available at the weekends and other times during the week and made them available at other times during the week. Um, we are seeing a, a, a steady reduction across a, a range of crime reporting uh, and incident reporting, uh, and that allows us to further flex um, how we do our business. So a lot of, a lot of operational support teams uh, uh, in, in the wider organisation have been specifically uh, deployed uh, as of this week. Uh, to spe specifically focus on the police's role in enforcing and getting the message out on the current uh, health care regulations. Uh, and that's almost a self-contained piece of business. So we have normal service delivery continuing as normal, uh, 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 and other resources have been made available specifically uh, to pay attention to this area of business. And I know, for example, the legacy team have been redeployed. Indeed. Are there other aspects where you've had wholesale redeployment of particular work streams? Not wholesale redeployment, but we have mobilised significantly a significant amount of workforce to work remotely from home, uh, both uh, across a range of functions, frankly, and for a range of reasons. Like every other organisation, we have people with health care concerns and shielding requirements, and we've been able to put those people off the police estate and working from home, still contributing to the overall effort, and a huge effort by our uh, technology and ICS department uh, to facilitate that. Uh, that can be tricky enough for organisations uh, doing that in quick time to, to manage a situation where police employees can securely access police systems from home is a significant te technological 
uh, and, and scale uh, delivery in a short period of time, but we've managed to achieve that. On the enforcement powers now that are available, obviously you've covered the, uh, at this stage the educational approach. Uh, I suppose I'm wanting to find out at, at what stage will you want to go down the enforcement approach and, and you know, I should say that I've certainly heard quite a lot of positive uh, comments about how the police have been carrying out its current role in, in this situation and trying to encourage people, but as you've indicated, the rubber hits the road at some stage when it, it will require enforcement. So when do we anticipate seeing that against individuals? And is there a policing role uh, being looked at for businesses as well around enforcement that may be required? Um, the, the situation for enforcement, I mean, uh, I do a daily review of this in uh, and we, we capture every incident as an organisation and hundreds of incidents a day where we've had some interaction in this space. Uh, and the judgment for me is at what point I think officers on the, on, on the road don't have the tools they need to do their job. Um, but I, I do suspect um, once we're well into the second week, you know, this time next week, uh, I would fully expect us to be exercising some degree of enforcement as part of our approach. It will always remain that option at the end, end of our uh, tactical options. Um, but I think you know, there comes a point uh, with a small percentage of our population that if they think there's going to be no enforcement, then they start to exploit that space, and I'll probably close that space, I suspect, from any time this week or next, this time next week onwards. But I wouldn't rule out doing it sooner if I feel it's necessary. Okay. Uh, and in that respect, um, I know in the Republic uh, of Ireland they've instigated this two-kilometre um, advice around even exercise and so on. And I know earlier last weekend you had made comments around and Newcastle and, and the kind of numbers that were going there. Is that something that's being considered um, in terms of a request so that people aren't travelling beyond their kind of locality to engage in what people have advised their, their daily exercise routine? Is that something that would be helpful? Um, this is not an attempt to avoid the question. It's an honest answer. Um, I think that's a judgment for health. Um, this is a healthcare crisis. Um, all the regulations that are on the books were designed, asked for, designed, and delivered on behalf of health. And we see very much our role as playing our part in protecting the health service and saving lives in, in terms of their approach. And I think it's for the Chief Medical Officer, uh, the, uh, the Minister for Health, and the wider executive to look at the overall effectiveness of package of measures in terms of protecting the health service and saving lives. And if there's, if there's, a, if there's a more requirement of legislation or more requirement for the police, then we're happy to play that role. But we haven't sought as an organisation to put ourselves in the forefront of asking for regulations. Okay, and finally, and then I'm going to bring other colleagues in. I have, I have other questions, but they may get picked up by members. My reading of the regulations are that the enforcement against individuals is only for the age of 18 and over. That's correct. How are we going to deal with people below the age of 18? Well, the, the fixed penalty, notice that stage four of the, of the four E's around enforcement, you're right, is, is, is 18 and over. Um, that doesn't mean uh, that uh, there are no tools available to officers with, with younger people. Uh, we, would, uh, we would foresee ourselves taking those people home, uh, speaking to their parents, uh, seeking their cooperation, considering whether the parents themselves are liable uh, in the circumstances who would be liable to the fixed penalty notice. Well, that would be a consideration as part of that uh, community restorative notices and, and other restorative uh, approaches which we use routinely with younger people to avoid criminalising them in a situation will still be available to officers. Okay. So it will be the usual approach in terms of policing. Uh, alongside that parenting and taking people home and restraining people home. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Al. Linda. Thank you, and thanks for your, your update, Al. I think you're probably right in terms of what you're saying about the PSNI's approach so far, having the right balance around um, speaking to people and engaging and, and doing that, because people want to see people who are gathering in groups just being dispersed, but they probably don't want to see that next level so I, I think the balance has been struck and I, I haven't heard anything negative about the PSNI's role in, in this so far so that's always a good sign I think around the young people there is a challenge but there is a lot of good work going on in terms of youth service engagement whilst they can't engage physically they're doing a lot of telephone work um, doing a lot of social media stuff they're doing a lot of stuff around like Skype and Zoom and things with young people counsellors in some ways, maybe are getting more time actually with the young people because they're not travelling about and trying to make appointments. They're actually able to sit in one place and do it. Um, 
you know, remotely. So sometimes these things actually work out better. And I think that's one of the things that we should be looking for in this as well. The PSNA, but ourselves as an assembly and right across the board, there are things that we have been able to do in relation to this emergency that we could roll out that would make us all more effective. Every one of us, and that includes the PSNA, the 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 prison service probably have a bigger challenge, but 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 all of us, and, and I and I include ourselves in this. So I do think that if there's learning to be made out of this, because we're always being told what we can't do, but we very quickly found out we can do it. So I think that there there are probably things that, and I'm sure that that the PSNA will have have learning from this, because obviously yes, yes, are already we're focused on were there different ways of working for officers, like working from home and working remotely and doing all of that. So. I think this is probably an opportunity to see that that in, in practice. Um, I, I don't really, I suppose, have any questions for you at this time. I just did want to put it on record that I do think you have struck the balance. Um, and I've seen it in action even in, in my own area, where there is an area where a lot of people go to on a Sunday. And on Sunday, there were a number of yards there. Now, I have no doubt most of those people were probably there, but trying to still do the socialisation. It wasn't a group of people gathered. But the police had stopped to make sure that that's what was happening and that there wasn't um, any kind of gatherings and that people were, were supposed to do, doing what they were supposed to be doing. So I do think that, that as long as we can keep it in that, and it will get more difficult, and we'll have a job of work to do to, I suppose, reinforce with people that the reason we're in the position we're in in terms of the figures of deaths to date is because people are doing what they've been asked to do, because people are complying. And when they stop complying, we're going to see the difference in death rates if, if, if we don't control that. So, uh, for me, it would be ideal if we're able to keep sort of in the in the space that we're in. But we'll have to just see what what happens going yeah. into the future. Thank you for your comments. I mean, I, I, miss, the, I get a large amount of feedback that we're probably in the right space. Um, these things are human endeavour. Um, you know, we have we have thousands of interactions with the public a day. Some of them we're going to get wrong, uh, and we'll just have to learn that and, and make sure we get it better as we go forward. But we are working very hard to achieve that balance. On the we'll never go back piece, um, you know, uh, the work we've done, our head of transformation and change has embedded members of their team within each of the strands that I have in this operation, and we're specifically gathering what we've changed, what's working, what's not, and creating an evidence base to say when this is over, the things we will not want to go back doing the old way. To make us a, a better uh, and faster, more uh, and more agile organisation, and that's just an active piece of the work we're doing because there's huge learning to be had. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Um, a number of my questions have already been answered, but in terms of PPE for um, officers, is there enough? Is there an order in? Um, is, is is everything sort of going as as okay with that? Um, and also just to pick up the point that Paul had raised about the utilisation of police force for closure of business, um, is that something that has been looked at or requested um, and if so, to what extent is that going to be rolled out soon? Um, the PPE question is, is a recurrent one across agencies. Um, the stresses and strains that you hear about the health service aren't any different for the rest of first responders including the police service. Um, you know. Uh, we're broadly using as, as much PP in a week now as we would routinely use in a year, uh, just because of the sheer scale of this. Um, that's a huge challenge at a time when there's massive global demand uh, against uh, restricted supply. Um, that piece is changing behind the scenes. We are, uh, we are part of the effort through the Assembly, uh, through the Department of Finance, uh, and that All Ireland North South uh, approach. Uh, about uh, you know, large quantity shipments. We are part of that consortium in Northern Ireland as part of that. But we're also plugged in to the National Police Coordination piece in the UK. Uh, so um, you know, we've, we've been exploiting every channel. Uh, I have a logistics cell specifically within under my command, uh, which has freedom to do business uh, with any supplier who's able to supply us what we want, the quality that we need. Uh, and we, uh, we aren't being shy about doing that. So that, that whole approach uh, through the Assembly, through UK policing and through our own efforts um, has improved the situation for us substantially. Um, but uh, I'm not complacent about that. Uh, we, are, um, you know, we have modest <coughs> stocks, I would say. Uh, everybody's equipped, but we have modest stocks. Um, 
we are not routinely providing uh, PPE to every officer in every set of circumstances, uh, because that would exhaust our supplies very, very quickly, and actually uh, would go well beyond the current Public Health and World Health Organization guidance, which is what we base uh, our piece on. So, the piece I touched about uh, at my last uh, piece with this committee about uh, remains to be the case, where we have dedicated identified resources in every district, which we doubled last weekend, uh, which are the first port of call for any COVID-related response. Those crews are fully equipped with all the equipment they need because they're the people we're putting into the risk situations. Uh, there is broader but lesser equipment available across uh, other police officers because they're not routinely dealing with those circumstances. But it's not a foolproof model. It is just, it is just risk-based. Um, and uh, in terms of your question about, there are massive orders. Uh, I have described it, and I, I don't, I'm not being flippant, uh, when, but I have consistently used the phrase, we have ordered eye-watering amounts of equipment. Um, and the, those are due to come online this week, next week, and the week after. Um, but like I said, uh, with increasing uh, infection rates in, in the community, increasing risk to, to, to my officers and staff, then invariably the huge amounts of equipment coming in will be matched with huge amounts of equipment going out and being used. So um, this is going to be an issue for some time, uh, not just for policing, uh, but for the health service, for care workers, for social workers, for social care workers, uh, all of that. Uh, and I think that's been well rehearsed uh, in, in the Assembly and well, well rehearsed uh, elsewhere in government, north and south as well. Uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's broadly where we are. Uh, but I'm not in a situation of having to put officers into high-risk situations who are not protected. So that, that's, that's the, f the first line of assurance that I always look for myself. Um, and uh, we do have uh, some provision uh, and significant amounts of stock due in again next week and hopefully the week after, and hopefully the week after that. Um, but we won't be long going through it either, so this is something we're just going to need to keep collective pressure on. Uh, you asked me your next question was around premises and closures. Uh, that's a joint effort for us, as I see it. Um, there are broadly, and it's very broadly, three aspects of the regulations as we see them. Uh, that public space piece about social distancing and gatherings and numbers, and that, that's very much the policing space. Uh, and that's where our priority is, and that's where we see our primary role. Uh, businesses that should be closed. Um, We've been involved in conversations uh, under the auspices of the executive office this week with a whole range of partners. But the broad thrust, as I see it, and others may see it slightly differently, but it's all emphasis rather than any major uh, dis uh, dispute. We see that as fundamentally something that's done in partnership between departments, local authorities, and the police, but the police being sort of the, the back end of that. So things like trading standards and others will have a view on who should be open and who should be closed. or whatever the, the arrangements are around that, whatever the local authority connections around that, whatever the departmental authorities are around that, I think there are mechanisms there that need to bring to bear uh, on those situations. Um, probably the one thing I would put slightly separate at is license premises, which probably does fall into the policing space. Uh, and where we get intelligence or reporting around that, then we'll certainly take that as part of our licensing. And I, I would very clearly say that not only is that fixed penalty notice territory for policing, but uh, frankly, uh, the clear message needs to go out for me as a police commander. If we as police find licensed premises with people inside serving drink in breach of these regulations, I will absolutely be highlighting it the next time their licensing uh, comes before the courts, and I would expect the courts to take a firm view on that, uh, just around the, res the social responsibility of people who run licensed premises, and just a clear message, I think, for me on that, uh, because that sort of undermines the whole process. Uh, and the other piece, really, we've been asked at, and I've had several conversations with staff association and, and union representatives about what, if any, the police role have in, 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 in policing with a small p those businesses that are open but may not be complying with the safety of, of their staff. Uh, I don't see a role for policing in that space. I think that's fun fundamentally for the management of those places and their staff uh, with, with their unions where that's appropriate and for the health and safety executive in terms of health and safety work provision beyond that. And I don't see police playing a role in that space, and I've explained that to the unions. Um, and all these conversations have been triangulated. I've had uh, numerous telephone conferences this week with uh, Northern Ireland Business Alliance, with representatives of large stores, representatives of small stores, uh, retail outlets, trading, and all those. Uh, and we're, and this, these are the two-way conversations that we've opened. We've opened regular channels there, back and forth, so we can get the feedback about how, how it's working, and also explain how we're placing it. So we sort of put a wrap around that to make sure we're getting as much information as possible. Out.
Jake. Um, I'll, uh, thank you. I, I, was, I was very lucky to be stopped on the way here um, by two of your officers uh, who are extremely diligent, professional, uh, informed and engaging, and I'd expect nothing else, I've got to say. So um, uh, thank them um, for, for giving me fair warning, uh, and, and, and thank you and your staff for the work that you're doing under extremely difficult uh, times. Uh, I guess, and I don't have, really have questions, and I, and I know the Chair touched on your numbers slightly, but if you're hemorrhaging officers at about on a natural rate of about 30 a month, plus those who are going off with, with, with COVID-19, you can see that there is considerable uh, issues there. And I take it all recruit training has now stopped. Is that, is that no, correct? No, that's not, that's not correct. And it links, oh. it, it links to original points. So clearly, um, you know, effectively the student officer program within PSNI is, is, a, is a quasi-university course. It's a, it's a police skills course, but it's underwritten by the academic institutions. We face the same challenges as the universities and academic institutions do in providing training at this time. But what we've sought to do, um, we really don't want to stop officers coming in the organisation. We already have people who are halfway through their training, uh, and we don't want to send them home. And people who have maybe during the next intake who have already given their notice to employers, we don't want to stop them coming in. So we've tried to balance that, um, and we've gone to significant uh, changes in how we deliver that training program in, in, in association with the academic institutions that underwrite it, uh, and, and, and uh, introduce a significant amount of social distancing to allow us to run. We won't be running at, uh, at the full capacity, but we will retain a capacity that helps to offset the people leaving uh, so that we don't have a, an overall uh, big negative impact in, in officer headcount. So we've made very clear choices around that by opting one or two courses out, spreading them out a bit, reducing class sizes, increasing the number of classrooms, putting more trainers in to allow that to be classes that are much smaller than they would have been in social distancing to be involved, and, and only doing close contact with student officers uh, around those areas where that's absolutely necessary. Um, we've also been in discussion with the Department of Justice about the regulations which govern the student officer program that would allow the chief constable potentially to review at which stage they are allowed to leave the training college and go and do other roles within the organisation. Uh, so we've had some cooperation around relaxing that to give the chief constable some flexibility on how we continue to keep the number of people coming through training and out in the organisation in a useful manner. And, and that second part, um, are you talking about some, uh, a, 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 an officer who's going through training, maybe gets halfway through training, three quarters way through training, and then could go out to a non-public facing role? So is, that, is that what we're talking about? That, that is what we're talking about, because at the minute the regulations require you to have done 23 weeks in the, in the police college before you can attest, and you can't, produce, you can't perform duty until you're attested. Um, but the Department of Justice is working with us on the regulations to bring some of that flexibility down where they could attest earlier, and then on a risk basis we would assign in the duties are are or are not public facing and are not presenting a risk to the officer and the public, uh, so they're not. So those people aren't lost to the organisation. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And just one more around the domestic abuse incidents. I know we talked about it when you were here a fortnight ago. Uh, has there been any more evidence in, in respect of those cases? Regrettably, so, Chair. That. Uh, the, the rate of increase that we saw uh, is being followed through. Uh, we are seeing uh, more reports of domestic abuse and, and domestic violence. And, and regrettably, uh, we, we now have uh, potential domestic murders that we're investigating. Um, and I don't want to say too much about that because some of those are likely to come before the courts uh, today or tomorrow. So, um, you know, uh, but we're certainly seeing that volume rising uh, as, as was predicted. Uh, we're doing a significant amount of work around that in terms of communications, in terms of working with partners uh, and all the other things around the prevention and support uh, that, you, that we, we, we would want to do at this time. It's certainly a significant priority for us, uh, but regrettably, yes, we are seeing increases in calls for service around that. The, the uh, case around the murder, is that today? Uh, it, the case isn't today. It has happened uh, within the last week. Uh, but. Uh, people are currently been interviewed and considerations have been made on what the next steps are in relation to that. Okay, well, obviously that will cause alarm. Um, finally, on the, the PPE, um, one of the issues I know has been raised are spit guards. Um, and I think there was a case recently where someone has been arrested for spitting in your officers. Regrettably, we've seen that trend not just here. It's, 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 uh it's been an issue for us in Northern Ireland. I've certainly seen reports of it in England, Wales and Scotland. And indeed, I know Angarda Shikana have experienced that in, uh, in the rest of Ireland as well. So um, 
thankfully, most of the people who claim to be COVID-19 positive uh, as a, and a means to avoiding arrest or coughing over officers and event, uh, as a means to avoiding arrest hasn't proved to be the case. Um, but uh, you know, it is a significant risk, and it's a risk that's going to grow over time if it's not uh, if it's not dealt with. So. You know, in terms of clear messaging for me, I've made it very clear uh, publicly, I'm happy to do so again today, that anybody who coughs or spits over any of my officers, any of my staff, or any other emergency worker or frontline responder can expect to be arrested and put before the court immediately. Uh, and I'll be looking to the courts to send out a similar message as to how those are dealt with. Clearly, that's a matter for the court, but I think we would all look to the courts for some, uh, for some leadership around that and, and enforcing our message. Mm. Um, so uh, I think that's the messaging part of it. Uh, we have brought forward following conversations with our various accountability uh, bodies, and we're, we've now issued spit guards to uh, staff who are in the custody suites uh, as the detention officers and indeed the police officers on duty. Uh, and that has, following further conversations with our accountability bodies, been extended to the crews who are dealing with high-risk COVID cases, the, the dedicated resources in districts, uh, and also those officers who may be transporting prisoners in cell vans. Uh, so those are two new categories of issue that have been approved as recently as yesterday, uh, and the officers involved in that will be trained and equipped to do so within the coming week. Okay, okay thank you. Alan, can I thank you for the work you're doing, and um, again, the, the high regard that we have for your team and the officers that are having to carry out these duties. It's very much appreciated, and keep up the good work. Thank you, Joe. Oh, thank you, Alan. Thank you. Okay, members, then... We're going to move to hearing now directly from the department. So members, this, obviously we can cover some of the issues that both uh, the prison service and police service have raised from the, from the department's perspective, but also um, this will cover a little bit more of the detail in respect of the statutory rule um, which has been laid. Uh, and obviously, there are sig quite a significant uh, number of the uh, aspects to that relating to the justice sphere. And uh, we're going to ask uh, Deborah and Andrew just to uh, take us through them. So, uh, the regulations, as we know, came into operation at 11 p.m. on the uh, 20th of March, and they cease to have effect within 28 days if not approved by resolution of the assembly. So, the assembly will need to uh, vote on this. Uh, issue. Uh, although the regulations are being taken forward by Department of Health, um, they apply a number of functions to departments that include justice. The relevant provisions for the justice sector uh, include the enforcement of requirements to close premises and businesses and restrictions on gatherings, offences and penalties, including the process for registration and challenging penalties. Uh, and so, in addition to providing a briefing on the department's COVID-19 response, officials um, have been asked to brief the committee on this aspect of the regulations. And again, members, this is only going to last um, for 30 minutes. So, welcome, Deborah, again, uh, to the committee, uh, Director of Justice Delivery, and Andrew Laverty, who is acting head of the Criminal Law Branch within the department. And the session will be recorded by Hansard and published in due course. So, Deborah, I think I'm handing over to you first. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to the Committee for the invitation this afternoon to give you a further update on the position in DOJ and also on the regulations. And I'd like to thank Andrew Laverty, who is the Head of Criminal Law Branch, um, for attending this afternoon. He will deal with those aspects. Um, we know you've already, already heard us as well from prisons um, and from the PSNI. These are indeed unusual um, and difficult times. Um, and across the department, the staff are pulling together to ensure that we are continuing to deliver our essential services. Difficult decisions are being made and challenging pieces of work are being progressed. You have heard about the challenges in prisons and in the um, PSNI and previously in relation to how we ensure respect and dignity for the deceased and bereaved. And you are aware of the new rules um, on staying at home and away from others. And we are reducing our day-to-day -day contact with other people to ensure that we will reduce the spread of the infection. I would like to provide you with a further update of the Department's actions since the last briefing. We have taken action to ensure that only those who need to be in work are in work. And where possible, we are accommodating working from home and ensuring that we are enforcing social distancing. We are finding different ways to do business and using technology to avoid the face-to-face -face contact. 
We are continuing to engage with our staff and providing regular <coughs> updates and information, including on health and well-being. In addition to the work in prisons and in the PSNI, you will be aware of the steps that are being taken in the courts. The Lord Chief Justice has issued clear guidance, including in respect of courts, to minimise the number of people who need to attend, to postpone future jury trials and to prioritise the most urgent business. He has also announced that with effect from Thursday the 26th of March, all court business will be consolidated in the following courthouses, the Royal Courts of Justice, Laganside Courts, Pregavan, Dungannon and Londonderry. Until further notice, only urgent matters will be heard, and these are likely to be undertaken remotely. You will also be aware of what is being done to ensure respect and dignity for the deceased and their loved ones during this current crisis. We are taking precautions to prepare for the risk that the normal burial arrangements are not sufficient. We will do all that we can to ensure dignity for the deceased and their family. And we are working with all of those involved to enable as many people as possible to be buried or cremated in the usual way. You will be aware that we are progressing work at the Kinnegar site near Belfast, which is to be used as the Northern Ireland temporary resting place in the event that it is needed. Work is also underway to provide pastoral support for families at this difficult time of grief and mourning, which will be particularly hard for them in the current circumstances. A dignity reference group has been established to ensure that respect for the deceased and their families is central to all that we are doing. The priority is to ensure that there is respect and dignity for the deceased and their families. I also want to provide assurance on the Department's preparedness. As I highlighted at the last briefing, we have in place our business continuity plans, business continuity managers forums, the Departmental Operations Centre is now in place and we have an emergency response team. We are also um, holding regular conference calls across the justice system and we have in place the appropriate reporting mechanisms. You will be aware that the Northern Ireland Hub is run by TEO and it coordinates the Northern Ireland response to the COVID-19 pandemic and feeds into the overall UK response through the Cabinet Office. That operates from 7 in the morning to 7 in the evening and also at weekends. In line with other departments, we have our Departmental Operations Centre and that reports into the hub, escalating issues that require cross-departmental working and support. And there is a liaison officer from each department who works in the hub. There are also then two high-level meetings to steer the work of that hub, the Civil Contingencies Group, which meets daily, the Civil Contingency Group comprises of the permanent secretaries from each department. You will also be familiar with the Executive Corvid Crisis Management Committee, which comprises the ministers, and that is due to meet again tomorrow. The Cabinet Office runs a number of ministerial meetings. The key meeting for DOJ is the daily General Public Sector Ministerial Implementation Group. Public order is a standing um, item on that agenda with other issues such as excess desks, which are also included. A DOJ senior official and the Minister have been dialling into these. We are preparing our situation reports to the Hub by 3 o'clock each day. We are working with our emergency response team to make sure that that is coordinated. and We have that information provided by 4 o'clock to the UK-wide COVID-19 dashboard. Our emergency response team complements and supports the ongoing efforts of business areas by acting as a conduit and providing information to the business continuity managers, to the board and to the minister, where issues have been resolved at local level, providing information and advice to inform decisions at a local level, and in particular to ensure consistency of approach across the business areas, and providing information and advice to inform the decisions at a departmental level where issues cannot be resolved within the local business continuity structures. We have also commenced work to look at our recovery phase, phase and lessons to be learned. We know that we are unlikely to go back to the way we used to do our business. And in all of this, our focus is to ensure the health and safety of our staff while still continuing to provide those essential services. 
So I hope that provides the committee with some reassurance on the department's approach um, in the current circumstances. And if you're content, I'll pass across to Andrew to cover the regulations. Thank you, Deborah. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Deborah. And thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to speak to the justice elements of the coronavirus regulations. Um, as the committee will be aware, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, uh, were brought into operation on Saturday, the 28th of March. And the regulations contain offences and penalties at Regulation 8 that are of direct interest to the Department of Justice. The inclusion of offences and penalties in any Northern Ireland legislation makes it a cross-cutting matter, which means that they require both the approval of the Minister of Justice and executive agreement. So the regulations, which have a fixed lifespan of six months, contain provisions to close premises and business and place restrictions on movements and gatherings to protect against the risks to public health from coronavirus. So a person who contravenes a requirement to close a business or premise or who fails to comply with a direction relating to a restriction on movement or gathering commits an offence and the penalty, the maximum penalty for which uh, is a fine of up to £5,000 upon summary conviction. As an alternative to prosecution through the courts, uh, the regulations also include provisions for a fixed penalty notice scheme that allow police to offer a fixed penalty notice of £60, uh, reducing to £30 if it's paid within 14 days, to individuals over 18 years old for lower levels of offending, uh, where an unpaid penalty notice, uh, or sorry, excuse me, where a penalty notice is unpaid, uh, the provisions uh, in the regulations allow for that penalty notice to be uplifted by 50% and registered as a court-imposed fine for enforcement by court-appointed fine collection officers. Uh, the Justice Minister was satisfied that the offences and penalties provisioned in the regulations were commensurate and proportionate uh, with other offences that can be tried on a summary-only basis in Northern Ireland and approve their inclusion in the regulations. And the Minister also supported the inclusion of the fixed penalty notice provisions, including the provisions that allow for the penalty notice to be enforced by court-appointed fine collection officers. These provisions were considered necessary and proportionate to make the penalty notice an effective penalty. And Chair, that's the end of the prepared note that I have, but if I may, you, you mentioned the regulations being silent on children, mm. and ACC Todd touched on that. I could add something to that if it would help at this point. Yes, it, it's on my list of questions, okay. so feel free to take it. Well, I, I wasn't intending to preempt everything that you might say, but, but certainly we as justice officials in working on the regulations um, were alert to the fact that there weren't specific children-specific provisions in them. So. Uh, over the course of the regulations being prepared last Thursday and Friday, we made contact with the Home Office officials who created the first version that was used as a template for each of the jurisdictions to ask what the intention was around children. Now, the regulations at Regulation 7 do include specific provision for a parent or a guardian to be guilty of an offence if they do not comply with the direction from the police to either remove a child or bring a child home or to stop at gathering. Mm -hmm. But, and the Minister also had this question for the Executive Office on Saturday whenever the regulations were being agreed by urgent procedure. The regulations do apply to children under 18. They can be charged, prosecuted, um, so long as they're over the age of criminal responsibility, which is 10 years for Northern Ireland. Um, and that would be a prosecution through the court. Now, clearly a fine of £5,000 isn't an appropriate penalty for children. And in that regard, I spoke with colleagues uh, with specific responsibility for youth justice uh, this morning, and they confirmed that a fine is not typically uh, used as a, as a disposal for children under 16. Instead, the police and the PPS um, who do not like prosecuting children for minor or first-time offending will actually use a range of diversionary interventions and disposals. And that can include community resolution notices, um, which doesn't attract a criminal record, can include uh, an informed warning from a police officer, 
can include restorative cautions, which is a, a sort of mini conference which is administered by the police, and also diversionary youth conferences. So that's a very small overview of some of what might be available for children of over 10 and under 18. Um, but I hope that it in some way offers you some more reassurance that the, the regulations aren't completely silent on children. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and I appreciate a bit more clarity on that. I would be keen just to, to see how the advice has been interpreted that the regs apply, um, because I don't see it specifically when I read it below the age of 18, and I think that may be subject then to whether or not you would have a successful prosecution. Not that I actually want to see the prosecution route, because I think we should be trying to avoid that for children, um, and it should only ever be a matter of absolute last resort if you ever even need to go there, and I would rather seek responsibility from uh, their parents, but that's not always uh, possible even for parents to be able to control 16, 17-year-olds who, who are determined to, to do their own thing. Um, so it's, it's a very difficult area to navigate, but one that is relevant, because I know that that's been an issue raised with me about gatherings of young people and not, not being kept in their, their own home, so it, it is a live issue that is going to be a um, requirement of uh, addressing. Well, as, as I say, Chair, it was a point that the Minister was specifically concerned about herself and she made the quest or posed the question to Executive Office uh, colleagues and officials on Saturday night, um, and that was the advice that was returned, uh, and on that basis the Minister was content to, to include the offence and penalties provisions. See, just on the on the on the regs, um, when it talks about the executive office, then uh, around businesses, um, about powers of direction, how how in practice is that going to work? If you ever get to that point, and and hopefully we we never do, but how would you get to the point where a direction will issue from the executive office against a business? Um, I would rely on executive office officials to be able to confirm this for you, Chair, but the advice that there's a difference between the England and Wales regulations and the Northern Ireland. The, the, they're a very broad instrument. They're designed to capture individual offending as well as corporate offending. Yeah. And in the England and Wales system, they can impose unlimited fines upon summary conviction. Um, so clearly that's a very significant deterrent for very big businesses. Mm. Within the Northern Ireland system, we don't have unlimited fines in the magistrate's court. There has to be a maximum specified fine amount, and the underpinning fines legislation set that limit at £5,000. So we put the question to the executive office when the instruments were being prepared on Thursday and Friday in terms of the gap between what's available in England and Wales and what's being proposed for Northern Ireland on the basis of the underpinning legislation. And their advice was that they were satisfied that the direction powers they had on the face of the Act allowed them to go after the larger businesses that they were made aware of or mm -hmm. became alert to the fact that they were contravening mm -hmm. any of the regulations. So those penalties, um, it's it's a trial either way offence, which means it can be tried in either the magistrate's court, in which case it's a fine of up to £100,000, mm -hmm. or it can be tried on indictment in the Crown Court and an unlimited fine can be imposed there. OK. Now, I'll, I'll be interested just to explore that more with TEO around what would the evidence base be before a direction would issue, yeah. because obviously it can't just be on social media, speculation, no. media contributions, there has to be a, a proper process and evidence base that would trigger a direction ever being made. So, um, Well, I'd, I would expect that they'll use other statutory bodies to support them in that. It may well be it's the health and safety executive. It mm -hmm. may be something that they, they work up with the Chamber of Commerce or with uh, local councils, Belfast Council, if it's Belfast-based companies, for instance. Okay. Um, Deborah, in terms of the department's um, role around um, PPE testing equipment, which is being sought after by the different aspects of the justice system, are, 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 is the department coordinating that on behalf of police, prisons, probation, etc.? And are you able to give us a figure as to what the justice system order is 
in, in respect of those different organisations for the various types of equipment? So we have been collecting that data. I don't have it with me today, but we can certainly get that to you. But we have been quoting that and making sure it's fed into the wider system. And those are one of the issues that obviously would be discussed at the CCG every morning. Okay, I, th I, I certainly would welcome that information. I know Ronnie was able to tell us 250,000 masks, for example, um, but didn't have the figures in terms of other aspects of equipment that's being sought. So um, it's Department of Finance are then um, corporately pursuing the procurement exercise for all of this across all of the, the civil service? Is that? Well, I think they're looking at how they will procure this and whether it's better to do it as a, as a wider system or whether it's individually. So obviously the police have been preparing their own business case, etc. on this, and we're looking at that, but that hasn't been decided yet. So ha has an actual order been made? I know there's been a cross-border approach to, to some of this where um, we're told flights have been chartered to go to China to actually bring it here. Has, has that actually happened yet? I, I don't know. I'll have to find that. Yeah. Linda? Just a quick question. There was some speculation in that it was more of a media thing than anything I've heard officially. Sorry. Um, around obviously the what was previously the army base is potentially going to be used for where it might be placed to be used for storing the remains for, for a period of time which I think everybody is I haven't heard any issues in relation to but there was some issue raised about the British army being brought in to carry out particular tasks and I think that that to be honest with you is unhelpful particularly when you're talking about the remains of people and these could be the remains of, of people who have families who have previously got issues with, with, with the British Army. So I think that that's extremely unhelpful and it would be good if we could get some clarification around whether there was any intention. I mean, one of the things that was even said to me is, is we have numerous tradespeople who are offering their services right across the board. And I know that there now is a, an email set up for those people to, to email in whatever services they can offer, whether it's logistics or tradespeople or for, for the executive. Many of them are offering that at, at voluntarily, and I think that that would be, I mean, in terms of, I suppose, for the community and at large and, and not bringing any controversial element into it, because this is about families who are already going to be in, uh, traumatised. I mean, to think that your loved one is going to be stored until a point where they can be buried is traumatising in itself. But if there's an additional, even for those families that would have no issue, actually, to be honest with you, around any British Army involvement, they're going to be traumatised by the fact that it's just controversial and that other people are, are shouting about it. And that would be a concern for me and, and even the potential then for some kind of public disorder. I mean, we've just spoken to Alan Todd and things in terms of, of the PSNA role around this is, is, in my view, going in a positive direction. And I just would hate to see anything being dragged in a negative direction where it doesn't need to happen. I'll come back to you with some clarity on that for you. I'll come back with clarity on that, but I'm not aware that that's the intention, but we'll clarify that. Okay. Rachel. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your brief. I just have a couple of questions. First of all, um, following on about the Kenninger Barracks, just to confirm that that is actually actively been looked at. Um, I've been contacted in my, in my area of Hollywood, the Kenninger residence. There are two entrances to the Kenninger Barracks, one from the Harbour Estate and one from the Kenninger, which is accessed from the A2. Um, would that be considered um, as the most appropriate access or would it be from the Harbour Estate? Because we're mindful of the community that is down there um, being in a, quite a sort of it is a quite of an insular community, um, but also just the, the to remove the obviousness of what is going on for people and, and not having um, children and, and, and people having to watch that if that has been done every day, um, just in terms of using that harbour state entrance. Um, the second one is in terms of the regulation and enforcements, and it was mentioned about that this would be enforced through the courts, but if the courts aren't meeting. Um, how would that be managed? And the third one then is in terms of the guidance that had been issued around for parents, say, who are shared custody of children, and it's within the, the statutory rule um, that sort of allowing parents to, um, you know, you can have, say, go and see your mum for a week and then back to your dad, that kind of thing. Um, would there be any guidance issued to the youth courts and so on just about that? 
Um, it had been raised with me over the weekend by a number of parents um, say, who had divorced or split up families and, and caring for children about would they be fined if they were found to be bringing their child to another family. You know, it's just the kind of the panic mode. But also if that had been used um, or could be potentially used by one parent or a carer to with, withhold access to a child um, without, you know, say, the contact centres and that kind of thing, just in a normal um, sort of shared custody relationship, if there's any information on that. Okay. So, um, and with regard to the, the Kinninger Barracks, so there, there is a, a business case that has been prepared around this, so it will have looked at the issues around the access and what's the most appropriate access, and they'll have to have, but I will, I will take that specific issue away and see if we can give you some more clarity on the particular issues that have been done around the entrance. Um, Obviously, Andrew will deal with the one in the regs. With regard to the Do one in the best. youth courts as well, um, maybe Andrew can help too. <laughs> Which one's that, sorry? On the youth courts, um, I'm not sure. But again, we can go back and speak to Peter Linney um, and the Lord Chief Justice on those issues. Yeah, I, I think on the specifics of the arrangements for shared custody, it's, it's something that uh, courts colleagues would need to provide specific advice on. I, I wouldn't want to speak to hypotheticals whenever it's, it's not a part of the court system that, that I'm familiar with. Um, on the regulations and in terms of enforcement, um, it's my understanding that the, there are three summary courts that are going to continue business. Um, I will get this confirmation from courts colleagues. Um, so magistrates courts, which will be conducting all business. Um, I believe that there may be a practical approach to it in the sense that proceedings could be initiated and then adjourned, immediately adjourned, um, and that allows the the enforcement, or sorry, the prosecution and subsequent enforcement to, to progress. There is an issue which uh, the Department of Justice Legal Advisory uh, resources identified with the expiry clause of the regulations, which uh, we have a paper into our permanent secretary for consideration. Um, we believe that the regulations, the intention is that any offence which is created specifically for the duration of the pandemic ceases to become uh, a valid offence after the regulations expire. Our understanding is that the intention is that enforcement would continue after the point of expiry, but the regulations don't include a specific saving provision which would make that completely clear. So we have a request in again with uh, Home Office colleagues uh, to, to get their confirmation as to what their expiry and post-expiry enforcement plans are. And given that we're, uh, we're being asked to operate the regulations uh, on a consistent basis across all jurisdictions, uh, we'll, we'll actually be looking at what we can do to make sure that, that and meaningful enforcement can continue after the regulations stop. So just to confirm, that would be for the Home Office to decide well, the, it wouldn't be something that could come through Northern Ireland? Well, we are, we're also looking at, we're speaking with Department of Health and with Executive Office colleagues because they're very much the, the policy setters who are giving us the direction of travel for the regulations. Uh, so we'll be looking at them and asking what do you wish to, to progress from a Northern Ireland specific perspective. It's, it's not simply that the Home Office will be dictating to us. There will also be a Northern Ireland element and it may well be that at a point towards the end of the regulations if a prosecution, if a charge has only just been made, there, there may be a, a sympathetic decision taken that cases like that may not be pursued. But it's something that we're very much working on and the regulations afford the opportunity for amendments to be made. Um, the Department of Health have to review them every 21 days. So, for instance, if there was going to be a change in terms of the lockdown arrangements, if a reasonable purpose was no longer going to be considered reasonable for leaving the House, the amendments would need to be amended to reflect that. And that ability to amend the regulations would also allow us to bring in uh, an amendment clause to fix the expiry issue if it turns out that that's needed. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Fruit. Yes, a, a couple of questions before I get to the guidance, though. Can I ask the question about the Justice Department? If you look inside, uh, inwards for a moment, uh, and what policies are in place to protect staff within the department? 
around people who have to isolate, people who go off with symptoms, people who are vulnerable people at home. I'd asked the question in the Finance Committee uh, if there was a sweeping pers uh, policy throughout the civil service for this, uh, and I'm not sure I got a, an answer yet, but I know I haven't, uh, and I just want to know is what policies are in place in the Justice Department for people who have to be, because uh, I know that you, the government doesn't really want government departments to use the furlough process. So is there a procedure in place and a policy in place for that? There has been guidance that has been issued um, so across the board for the whole of the NICS, which does advise people what they should do. So if they live on their own, they develop symptoms, they should isolate for seven days. If they live with a family, they should isolate for 14 days. So there is detailed guidance there. Um, there is also a hub that's been set up for staff so they can go, which frequently asked questions, etc., which provides all of that guidance about what people should do in those circumstances around making sure that they are staying safe and making sure that others are, are staying safe. And then there are policies there around where um, people can be given special leave for, for particular circumstances, etc., and um, those with vulnerabilities, etc., as well as whether they would be available to um, avail of the special leave. So there is guidance there around all of this. And in addition to that, um, the head of the civil service wrote out um, last week, um, and our permanent secretary is writing out regularly to staff as well to make sure that people are being kept up to date. Because, as I said the last day, this is moving very fast, and things are changing very quickly, and we need to make sure that we are engaging with our staff. We have quite a few people who are at home at the moment, who are self-isolating or working from home, etc., and we are making sure that we have in place engagement with those staff regularly and methods of communication and we're looking innovatively around how we can use home um, computers etc to keep in contact um, we've recently explored the use of zoom etc you know to make sure there's a face-to-face -face contact because the mental health of our staff is hugely important and we know in these very difficult times just that contact with 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 the office can actually really help people Okay, and, and they're supported through remuneration also, so yes. nobody's going to end up coming short here at the end of a period, a uh, very traumatic period, of course. But that's important. Uh, I mean, can I Mr. Free, if, if, if it might help, I could offer you some personal uh, examples of what's happening within our division. Um, each of uh, we're from the Criminal Justice Policy and Legislation Division, and, and this is mirrored across the department. Um, each of the heads of branches have a, a secure laptop. Um, our computer system is a secure system, um, so it's not something that you can easily connect into f with normal IT equipment. But each of the heads of branches, myself included, we're all home working. We have access to those laptops, which allow us uh, access to secure emails and also to our uh, trim our database of, of working records. Um, as Deborah's mentioned, there's uh, weekly updates from the head of civil service and also from our permanent secretary. So we, the heads of branches, are then disseminating those out to our office colleagues who are also at home um, because if they're not an essential worker, they're not required to come into the office. So it is about keeping them safe, keeping families safe, um, all of us have got relatives that I'm sure we're all concerned with. Um, so it's about doing as much uh, <coughs> working as it's possible to do. Um, and as Deborah also mentioned, I believe that they're, they're exploring um, an IT system which might not allow access to the database of records, but it might allow some sort of controlled access to work emails which would greatly open up the opportunities for, for people with access to a laptop or a personal computer to be able to do meaningful work. And that's a big part of what we're trying to do, to make sure that staff don't get into a sort of drift that they feel forgotten about. It's about maintaining contact and maintaining their mental health, uh, trying to look positive, trying to keep them engaged. and. Hopefully that offers you some sort of reassurance in that respect as well. Okay, and, and again, safe distancing practices are being put in place. Yeah. I'm sure some places are different than others, some environments are different than others, built environments, so that would me maybe be challenging more <laughs> places than others, but that's all being adhered to and trying to implement it as much as possible. Well, just this morning um, I called into the office to collect some papers. Um, 
because it, it, it is difficult to, to work remotely if you don't have a lot of the reference material that you would use regularly. Um, and even before last week when we were given the instruction to work from home if you possibly can, and that instruction then became a direction to go home unless you're an essential worker. So people were moving around the office where there was spare space. People were able to, to create significant social distancing between themselves. Um, so I, I didn't see it as an issue within Access to Justice Directorate and certainly within my own branch and other branches in the immediate locale in our office was being very carefully adhered to. Okay, good. Uh, can I then ask about the Access to Justice piece and the, the, the many fathers and mothers uh, who would be awaiting a court date and then a judgment on access to their children? Um, this could well be one of the major undercurrents that we see here with regards to a, a bunging up of a system uh, whereby courts aren't able to perform their function properly and that so many people who have been denied access to their children up to this point and who are waiting patiently for a court directive in order to gain custody, even joint custody or access to their children. Now, now feel that there's no hope uh, in them seeing their children anytime soon. Is there anything that can be put in place, or any measures that can be put in place that that may, first of all, maybe see that rule out of court cases in this regard, or is there anything that can be put in in the interim period, realising that this is, in some cases, very serious family settings uh, and has to be attested in court? Is there anything that been looked at? So, as I understand it, um, the Lord Chief Justice directions give examples of what is considered to be urgent business, but that isn't exhaustive. So, um, when it comes to issues around contact arrangements for children, um, that's certainly something that could be brought to to, um, to the courts. Although it's not specifically mentioned, that's my understanding. Right. Of it. Okay. That's good. Uh, with regards to the guidelines themselves, of course. Remarkable, remarkable, remarkable guidance for remarkable times, and and again, we wouldn't want to see this any longer than it needs to be. Uh, there are already some questions coming out of this, whereby people would be contacting me to say, "Well, look, I run up a certain road every morning, up, up a certain track or hill, uh, where there's nobody. If I leave my house and run uh, and jog, I bump into so many people up the street." There's wee things like this. We have, we have uh, people who are gardeners. We have people who are window cleaners. A window cleaner asked me, is it okay if I can clean windows? I said, as long as you do the outsides only. So it's things like that. Uh, and I, of course, I was being it's trapped in the case, who's a good friend. Mm -hmm. But you, you can see where these wee anomalies appear. And people are so frightened at the minute because of the virus. But they're then now also very frightened about these determinations and guidance. And that's not a mindset you really want to keep going uh, outside of... It's not sustainable in the long term. No. Um, so, so those wee anomalies, uh, it, will there be some sort of guidance or advice issued as we, as we find these wee questions and anomalies coming? Well, I think that's, that's part of the reason why there's a built-in review um, in the regulations that the Department of Health have to review them every 21 days. Yeah. And it's to look at what they can learn about where issues are arising and if there's if there are issues which are are being demonstrated to have a broad base of impact then obviously it's something that the both the department of health and the executive office here are largely responsible for setting the restrictions um i'm sure that they'll want to look at those and consider those and as i said to um, rachel uh, the regulations, there's a, an order making power or a direction making power in there that they aren't fixed and finite from this point on. They can be reviewed, they can be amended. So I think the, certainly the media message is being rehearsed repeatedly on, on the news and, and on the, the music stations between songs about leave house once a day for exercising. Um, I think Perhaps where some of the confusion is coming from is the different measures in different jurisdictions where uh, in the south of Ireland uh, there is a strict two kilometre 
uh, radius, if you like, where, where people are allowed to, to freely move about. The regulations for Northern Ireland are silent on distance, um, and there aren't restrictions in terms of the types of places that you can go, so long as common sense is applied and, and as ACC Todd you know, advised earlier, really not appropriate to be travelling long distances to, to spend an afternoon in Newcastle or walking on Torella Beach or anything like that. But um, there's also then the different approach to the regulations which is being reported in the mainstream news in England and Wales where different police forces there are taking different approaches. Yeah. We're actually quite fortunate here that we only have one police force who are doing the operational rollout of the enforcement of the guidance. So that message will be consistent for Northern Ireland purposes at least. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I trust that the review mechanism, which is formally built into the regulations, which require Department of Health to look at them every, every 21 days, would allow any issues such as those which yourself and colleagues, I'm sure, would be able to bring to, to them. Uh, can be made sure that those are taken con into consideration. And again, my final point, Chair, and I think it needs to be raised, I, I would disagree with Linda on her points around the Army. Um, and I would hate for uh, a, a nervousness to creep into a decision-making process, uh, because the, the Army is an amazing organisation and has proved its worth even over the last number of weeks with the building of the Nightingale uh, Hospital. If you want something done, the Army is the best organisation to get it done. But not only that, people on the ground, not only infantry, you have engineers of all hues that will keep ventilators going and electric going, uh, air tubes going. You will have field hospitals, uh, medics of the highest calibre who work through the toughest decisions, field ambulances, uh, all operating and all trained up to the Geneva Convention. Uh, there should be no delay. If we need people on the ground, there should be absolutely no delay from the civil service and the officials. When they need help, they should seek the help and get it from the army. Well, I think Deborah could probably cover that point if, if she feels there's any need to add to that. that but obviously, that gets into areas which are wider than, than what we are responsible for. I think um, Linda's question was in specifically to the Kinniger and that arrangement. So I will provide clarification on that. As to the other issues, I think they're wider than the DOJ. Okay, thank you. Okay. Linda, yeah. Sure. Well, I understand where you're coming from, that you would have no issue, but you have to accept that others would have a, a really, really serious issue with it. And it's a very, very sensitive issue yeah. for people. So I don't think that we should you know, be so forceful in terms of, and, and that's why I even approached it in terms of that, think about the sensitivities, think about the ramifications, think about the ramifications for our own police force here, for the PSNA, for us as a government, and all of the, the ramifications, because in a few months, please God, this will all be over, but we'll have to deal with the fallout of it. So I don't want decisions to be taken that we're dealing with the fallout for, of for years to come. So I'm really, I don't want to be, but, but I would like some clarification around that issue, to be honest, and I would like it urgently. Can I add to that, as though? As quickly as possible, but, yep. I, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to, I'm trying not to be forceful on the issue because we have to give people flexibility, I understand that, but I do have to impress upon people the, the massive issue that this will be for a large number of people. It's very sensitive, it's very emotive, it's not something that's even a... a political point for me it is very emotive for a lot of people out there but, but I just I, yeah. I don't want it even to become a I, yeah. thing for, for our Can I ask you the very important aspect to this and the differential here is that it's we're not talking about a security situation or scenario where we have police where we have soldiers on the ground to support a police force we're talking about things that need done in an operational sense and can I just say that if, if I need help if my health is failing and I need to breathe, and I can't breathe, I don't care who comes to help me, I really don't. If I have somebody who's died, a family member who's died, and they need it to be treated with dignity, then I don't care who helps me, I, I want that loved one to be treated with dignity. And if it just happens to be someone who serves in the army, I'm okay with that. Thanks, yeah. yeah thank you. Um, uh, all the other members content? Okay. Um, Deborah, Andrew, thank you very much for, for coming to the committee today. And there's a few points of clarity, just obviously, that you'll provide to us, but we appreciate you giving up your time to uh, come to the committee.
Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Okay, members, uh, in respect just then around the um, specific regulations, obviously that will come to the, the floor of the Assembly in due course. Um, I, I would wish to be able to make a contribution as the committee chair. I know we did uh, a couple of weeks ago agree that we would be broadly supportive of what was being taken forward, uh, and I'm just looking um, agreement that that still remains the case uh, in terms of the committee's position, unless there's some further clarity. That's one yeah. to Paul. I, I, I didn't ask the question because I didn't think it was their place uh, or my place to ask it of them. But what I what I, I think my mind's going towards, no, no, doubt, no doubt about it, I was very nervous about these regulations. What probably changed my mind more so was the, the weekend of the mass movement to the beaches and one thing mm. or another. Uh, and the sense that people weren't maybe taking this so seriously, and especially when we seen the footage coming out of Italy, uh, I think that scared a lot of folk, including myself, to be honest. Uh, but now I'm thinking is, where where is the exit strategy here? Where, where is it when we lift these mm. considerations and conditions? When is the right time to do that? Because that's not known yet. And how do we actually get to a place, a square, where we are relieved of these and we're sure that it's the safest thing to do. So I suppose what I'm asking for, and I, I think that the, this committee should be asking for, is where is the exit strategy and what does that exit strategy look like and where is the place we're going to and at what time? Um, the, the, to me, there's only three ways that we can actually exit this. One of them is probably the most favourable, and that's testing to the point where we're sure of our facts and figures, and if we don't ramp up testing, we ain't going to get there. If we're not going to get there, how do we exit? So all of this is starting to worry me now as to how we progress. We're not even through the, don't get me wrong, we're not even through the peak yet, of mm. course we're not, and we've still a lot of hard weeks to go, and hard days to go, but, but ultimately we're going to have to somehow bounce back and bounce out of these guidance and regulations. And I suppose I want to see a clear path ahead of me with mm -hmm. regards to that. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair point to make. Um, well, are you content um, if the committee was to write to the, uh, the minister, the executive office, as to recognising that we're being put into these regulations in the current framework, but seeking to get clarity around uh, what are the mechanisms to which this is going to be lifted? Yep on what thought that there is around the criteria that will be applied, what do we need to be seeing you know, take place um, in order to facilitate a relaxation of the current measures that have been put in place? Are members content that we would ask that generic question? Yeah? Sure, okay. if it's helpful just um, to highlight that there is a requirement on the Department of Health to review every 21 days the need for the rules, so we can ask on what basis, what, how, they'll do that. how they're doing that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then we'll proceed. Um, in terms of the forward work program, members are content. Um, there's just some changes, uh, obviously, in respect of how we're managing business. Um, the committees were asked to meet only when necessary to consider matters relating to the COVID-19 response and any other essential urgent business, and that meetings should be kept as short as possible. Number of witnesses attending any meeting kept to a minimum, and written briefings preferable to oral briefings where possible. Um, I think we've done that today and, and uh, can justify the way in which the committee has uh, conducted its, its meeting. And I, I want to thank members for the diligent way that they went about their business um, and also the witnesses for facilitating us. Um, as a consequence of the current circumstances, taking account of the guidelines um, above, consideration has been given to uh, the items on the forward work programme that have been deferred from the meetings on the 19th and 26th of March. A number of these items are due in April, and proposals to handle each of them are set out on uh, the relevant pages in your meeting pack. So it's there, members, for your agreement that we would um, carry out the future work as outlined in the meeting pack, if you're content. Okay. Um, Guidance has been provided for committee business in current circumstances, encouraging committees to consider writing to their respective departments advising of non-essential business, and a draft letter is um, included for members' attention, and if you're content, then we'll issue that letter 
uh, to get that information from the uh, department. There's a draft holding letter um, to be used to respond to any general correspondence or requests for meetings that are received during this period, and that's also been prepared if members are content then um, with how we deal with that issue, then we will action that accordingly. Okay, content. Um, some correspondence, there's five items of correspondence uh, in the meeting pack. Um, there's one item uh, just to draw members' attention to. Um, there is a response from the Minister of State in the letter to the committee in respect of the department's budget uh, in regards to the separated regime in McGabry. The minister highlighted that the independent panel had produced a report with recommendations for a strategy to disband paramilitary groups, bring about an end to paramilitary activity, recommended that DOJ should revisit that framework related to the separated regime and arrange for an independent review to be undertaken to examine the operation of the regime. That was contained in recommend, recommendation B8. The Minister indicates that he understands the review has not yet taken place, believes that any discussions on funding between DOJ and the UK Government would benefit from understanding the conclusions of such a review and what the separated regime may look like in the future. So, um, if members are content, we'll forward that uh, correspondence to the department and ask for the department to give us a response in respect of that. Yeah, Chair, uh, I suppose I'd asked for this uh, way back a number of weeks ago. And we were a bit confused because ultimately we asked about the cost of separation. We didn't really ask about the wisdom or the necessity or anything of such like. Uh, we are what we are, it is what it is. We know that. Uh, but it's the cost we were worried about and the fact that it burdens our Justice Department. Whenever it's not a decision for the Justice Minister to take, it's the Secretary of State, and the Minister of State has written to us, and he's basically saying, I think, if I'm reading this right, and I am confused, is that this review needs to take place. Well, I would like to see the framework for the review and the, term and the, the terms and conditions for the review, and surely we could ask that of the Department. But ultimately, what will that change? Will it mean that there's a change in the way separation is run? Will it end separation, or would it recommend to end separation? Because that's not the Justice Department's call. Um, so I don't know why he, he's, he's caveating the two together. The review of separation and the operation of separation with the cost and the decision-making of that lies fair and squarely with the Secretary of State. So, I, if, if it be the mind of the committee, I would write back to the Minister of State asking if he can clarify and, uh, that fusion that I would have uh, and to, to see why, why is he linking the review that's to take place with the cost and the decision-making process on separation. And it's fair and squarely in the hands of the Minister of State or the Secretary of State and the NIO. We can certainly write to the Justice Department asking where the review is and why has it been delayed and the terminology and conditions around the review, the scope of it. Uh, so that's two actions I suppose I'm asking for, Chair. Okay. Members, I'm in your hands as to what you want to do. Um, I think I grasp what Paul's seeking to, to get information from. I'm happy that we would get more feedback from the Department in terms of the general response that has been provided from the, the Minister of State and the NIO, um, but it's whether you want to write back um, to, to ask the question around the decision-making process vis-à-vis -vis the cost that that then incurs being a separate issue to the wider review. Sure, uh, yeah. I, I, I get a different reading from this. Um, the, whether or not we have separated the prison regime is, is not down to the, to, to the Secretary of State. Who goes into it is down to the Secretary of State as well. We have it. But, but we could, as an executive and as an assembly, end separated regime. So the two are. So, it's only, only, so, so we have the power to end it, but we don't have the power to decide who goes in and out of it. Uh, that, that, that's an, through the Chair, that's an interesting tag, which we, I'll need to assess more. But, but then. Because I ask you, Doug, if you play this out, so if the executive was to end separation, and then the Secretary of State started to put individuals into separation, how would that work? Uh, again, I'm throwing that out there. He, he, he retains it um, because.
because he retains the, the issue of, of terrorist, terrorist offences. So he retains that. I mean, it's the same, it's the same um, uh, with, with some of the other issues. For example, he can, he can pardon somebody from a terrorist offence, whereas the Justice Minister couldn't. Um, so it, it retains that. But there's no separate regime. You, can't, you just simply can't put them into it. You know, so that, so it's not his. Remembering, of course, the separated regime came in when we were in direct rule. Mm -hmm. I think it was 2002, 2003, I think it, mm -hmm. when it came in. But we were definitely in direct rule at the time. But it's definitely ours to, to, to close it down. But he decides who was in it while it exists at that moment. Well, are you content, Paul, if we, we get the feedback from the department in the first yeah. instance, see what the department's saying about that review issue? Yep. And that's something that we could explore further? Yeah, I'm happy enough with that. Yep. Okay. Okay, members? A quick point on it. I suppose one of the things that we need to bear in mind around the separated regime is Ronnie's comments when he was asked about it when he was in here. Even if you ended the separated re regime in the morning, effectively, you would end up with a separated mm -hmm. regime, which would be much more difficult for the staff to manage and, and we have to consider them in this as well because whatever disagreements we may have or, or agreements for that matter in, in terms of the separated regime, the the issue would be the, the main and major issue would actually end up being for the prison staff which are already face significant harm. I'm not sure that it would be to their benefit. But but this is a separate issue, and I have no issue with the, and, and again, asking I'm, the questions. You know, I'm there with you with regards to asking. I'm not asking the question whether we should have it or not. It's the cost burden of it, and whether that's rightly well, falling, no no where it's fairly falling on the Justice Department or not. You know, that's the. Okay. The other item, just in the table pack, the CGI report on review into the methods of the police service using information in respect of historic cases. The Office of the Police Ombudsman for Northern Ireland that was published earlier today makes a number of strategic and operational recommendations, so it's there for members um, to note. If you're content to action, then the rest of the correspondence is outlined in the cover sheet. Okay. You're sorry. You're all right. It um, will be my hearing as much as anything else to be. Um, if you're content, then we'll just action the rest of the, the correspondence as outlined in the cover sheet. And is there any other business? If there's no other business, then um, we'll set a, a meeting in due course whenever that becomes necessary. Okay. Right, sure. um, Let me just ask one question. Apologies. The Minister had talked about um, the domestic abuse bill coming after the Easter recess. There's now some talk about the possibility that there won't be an Easter recess. I don't know whether that's going to, um, you know, come about. But and, and even if there's no Easter recess, whether that actually be sitting, I don't know what way it's going to work out. But it, it's maybe something we just need to keep an eye to in case she comes back to us and says if we're going to have sitting days, we'll, we'll bring it forward early. I don't know whether she will, but just something we need to bring. Yeah, I like it. How we deal with the, the, the domestic abuse as it gets introduced, um, the minister is keen to introduce it, and I can understand the necessity for it. And, and we do need to keep some element of the top priority work of the committee going forward, particularly around legislation. Um, and that would be my view, um, complying uh, obviously with the, the PHA guidance and, and the assembly framework that's been set up around that. So. Uh, the Minister did indicate she wanted to introduce it on the 28th of April. Um, as soon as we get it, it becomes the Committee's responsibility as to how we go about gathering the evidence, doing our work. And obviously that's going to um, be somewhat different to the norm in light of the current circumstances. But um, this is legislation that was due to be passed at Westminster. People understandably want to see it, um, and, and we're just going to have to be innovative in the way in which we go about um, the work of this committee. But when it comes to that, we'll, we'll draw up a, a framework as to how we can do that in compliance with the current rules that, that exists. And we'll, we'll discuss that as a committee and come to an agreement around the parameters for, this conference for the work. This conference has been running for a long duration. Please press star one. Never started. I'll second that. <laughs> I've got one minute. Well, on that note, if we're content, <laughs> then we'll adjourn the meeting and I'll call one in consultation with the clerk in due course. Thank you. Hey, Senate Chamber Programme. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.